Welcome, welcome, welcome. Another episode of of Scene DMs. Uh, obviously, you're one of your hosts, Big Merv, Mikhail McIntosh, and... Yes, sir. Deuce Wayne checking in. Yeah, it was kind of delayed, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, you know, I, mean? I didn't know it was a. What did, what did Bron say in his last game? I didn't know it was a swing, swing. Uh, I thought you were on some Rushi Hashimura stuff. Just... No, no, no. You know, I swing the rock uh, barely. Brock um, the top said, "I just made ten shots. You gonna shoot it? Swing, yeah, swing, swing, mother- swing, 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 mother." That was going to hilarious. Killer instinct that people don't be talking about, though, right? Um, anyways, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but no, this episode is obviously really special. Um, this is our 50th episode, man. This is, this is big time. Who would have yes, thought? Yes, sir. Uh, who would have uh, thunk it? Who would have thought? Hmm? Who would have thought? Look at, <laughs> look, look at us. Look at us. Look at us. Look Just at us. Two guys podcasting. Yeah, damn right. Uh, but, but nah, man. Um, it's been a one hell of a, a road to get here. One hell of a road. And I'm glad that we were, um, we've been able to, been blessed to get to these, this, this level, right? So, um, one second, let me get to my notes. But uh, but yeah, dude, bro, how you doing? How's life? What's going on with you? I'm well, man. Uh, life's been good. Just preparing for the season. I always say that, but it's really around the corner. I have training camp next week, so about to head out just now. I uh, can't complain. Like you said, the spirit of Halloween is upon us. So it's been a been a tough time for me in terms of me and my nightmares. I had to sleep with the light on the past couple of couple of nights because all these movies man's been watching. Um, but outside of that, man, family's good. Got to see moms last week. Spent some time with her, kick it with the gang. Uh, how about you? I'm good, man. I'm good. Um, just keep on, keep it on. You feel me? Uh, trying to just get over this unfortunate uh, body ache. And just get back on the court, man. You know, I miss miss playing and miss being out there. So, yeah. Uh, but no, nah, man. Speaking of basketball, um, like we always say, we're basketball players first, and movie lovers second. Um, yo, so the NBA season obviously has started. Uh, there's been many stories. Uh, well, not really. There actually hasn't been that many stories usual to what goes on in, in the NBA. But um, there's been some struggles, man. There's been some struggles for players, some teams. And there's yeah. been some hot players, pause. And there's been uh, hot teams, pause. Um, but how important is the start of the season? Like, how important is the start of the season to a team success to you? I think it's super important. I don't think it's the end of the world, so I don't want to mix those two things together. But I think it's important to establish a rhythm for your team, for your identity, uh, for the chemistry, just for the players going forward to – understand and comprehend what guys' roles are, what their value is to the team, and understand how they could be a star in that position. Um, I think that it's always good to get off on the good foot, no pun intended, uh, because I always feel like a lot of teams around that all-star break try to kick it into high gear so they can make that last playoff push. But if you do your early work, then you won't have to be finding yourself with your back against the wall, so to speak, uh, near the middle of the season. So... I think it's imperative that, you know, teams establish a good identity, but also, you know, rack up a few wins and don't take, you know, the home court for, for, for granted, you know, get, get, make sure you protect your home court. And also when you're on those road swings, you try and, you know, steal a couple of games here and there just to, you know, make sure, because now we know that the league is so loaded. Anything can happen. There's players in a lot of markets and smaller markets. So you can't just rely on the fact that you're a part of a big organization. You actually have to back it up with your play. Mm-hmm. No, I agree, man. I agree. I think that um, it's not a very important, but let's not like jump to conclusions on either end, um, mm-hmm. because um, I think that you can start off hot and all of a sudden uh, fizzle out, and then that happens a lot um, to teams. Some teams start off great, and we're like, "Yo, this is our year," and then boom, trash. So it's just a part of the process, man. A part of the process, but I definitely agree. Um, on that, um, obviously we're talking about some teams. Um, let's kind of focus in on Philadelphia, huh. um, and their superstar, huh. Joel Embiid. Um, huh. he recently said a comment, came out saying a comment that he will not be playing back to backs ever. And he, he feels like he will never, ever play as long as he can. He will not play back to backs. How do you feel about that? And like, how big of a slap in the face do you think it is to fans 
um, or not smack in the face after signing such a lucrative deal? Like, how how much do you think it affects the fans in that regard? It's hard, right? Because we're also professional basketball players, so we're coming from the aspect of the perspective of both sides. Just also being a fan of the game, but also being a part of the game. So, I think now in today's game, with the nuances of technology and just being able to take care of yourself and understand the different analysis of people's bodies and players' actual baseline and where they are today when it comes to the game, I respect the fact that people are able to, you know, to understand their bodies and be like, "Yo, I can't do this," or "I don't want to push this limit because if I do, this might be something that will promote an injury." Um, so it's kind of like a preventative measure. But at the same time, when you look at a guy like Braun, who just made a comment when they asked him in the locker room, you know, back to back, you're going to play tomorrow. He said, I plan on playing every game. It's like when you look at someone who's 39, about to be 40 in a couple of months, it's like, how can you, as a Joel and B, look at that and, and, and think that's okay? Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest gripes I had with Anthony Davis in the past. It's just like, how can you not stay healthy? But then you have someone who's way older than you who's putting in the work. And to make sure that he's always available for his team. And we hear this saying a lot in sports, but specifically in basketball, where availability is the best ability. So I don't know if I'm Joel Embiid. I I understand from his perspective, he's dealt with a lot of injuries. So maybe he's just like safeguarding himself. But at the same time, you owe. It's a a weird thing, again, because I played a game. So I understand you got you come first. But at the same time, you know, you did sign a big contract. So these, you know, these kids are. You know, they got that season ticket because they want to see Joel Embiid. They want to see you play on a nightly basis. They don't want to come to the game and see you on the on the side with sweats. Um, and I just think it's a different mentality. It's a different era because back then, you know, guys are playing through anything. But again, that doesn't mean it's the best thing. You know, mm-hmm. nowadays guys are smarter. So it's like, I don't have to play through this injury. You look at Kawhi, for example, who <laughs> is like, I'm not playing. Gonna bring him next, like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not forcing it, bro. Like, y'all can't. Y'all can't. He's, he's not, not about bro. forcing. He literally can't. Like, literally can't now. Literally he's can't. Like, so because before, when he was on the Spurs, they were trying to force him to do it. Remember? They were moving yeah. sick. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if Joel's thing is more so like he's, you know, just playing it cautious, playing it cool. But I did yeah. see him on the sideline because they recently played the Raptors and he looked like he was in great shape. Looked like he was slim. I mean, it's hard to tell. He was in, he was in some essential sweats, but looked like he definitely was, you know, lost some weight and all that. But it's just, it's sad whenever you have a marquee player, a franchise player that's not playing all games um, quite yeah. frank and simple and especially especially with the team that they have like you know what i mean you want to build chemistry you want to build something um and you're not you're going to be unable to do that because now when you come back you're going to try to take tyrese maxi's minutes mm-hmm. i mean sorry not minutes is his, his shot attempts yeah and like that's an adjustment that's going to be adjustment for him and stuff like that so like if you play the entire season then everybody already know their role but now there's people they're shooting bare times that as soon as you come back, bro, their, their shots going to be taken down and how are they going to yeah. be affected by that? So and even I, see it both, I see it on both sides for sure because I feel like um, as an athlete, man, you got to protect yourself and got to exactly, look out yeah. for yourself. But uh, but sometimes, man, like if you can, you can. You know what I mean? Like how many times have like we played through injuries because we know we can't. You know what I mean? Like we know, mm-hmm. like, bro, the game's important. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the, every game is important, especially overseas and places we've been. Like, it, it's, these games are important. You can't just sit out of a game. Like, imagine those in those Canada windows that we played, that yeah. there's two games, and we played one game, and because it was, like, technically a back-to-back, manager like, I can't play the second one. Right. And every manager's like, bro, like, what, they play a five Nick, five guys. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like how would they play? So, I don't know. I think I, I feel like um, there are certain, there's a time and place for sure, and I'm maybe saving himself from the playoffs, but I don't feel, like, respectfully – Respectfully, of course, he's done enough in his career for him to do that. Like Kawhi won a ring, won championships. You know what I mean? LeBron mm-hmm. obviously is GOAT, so he can do that kind of stuff. But even he's choosing not to. So I don't know. I find it interesting and weird, but I, I do as well. And like you said, I think it's just that fine line because, again, we understand they make a lot of money. So when you are making a lucrative amount of money, it's like, is a love for the game still there? Not questioning his love, but I'm just saying, like you said, when you're playing overseas and it's like, bro, if I don't play in this game, I'm facing the, the fact that I might get cut from yeah. this team. It's like I'm playing for survival rather than, you know, these guys are comfortable, bro. They all have a great living situation. Again, not trying to count anybody's pockets or, or you know, I don't know what their lifestyle is like. But again, you look at that contract, it's like, lifestyle. what's the motivation? Yeah, you're making $200 million. Dollars. Right. What's the, what's the, what's the motivation for him? He's like, I'm still, it's a guarantee. <laughs> like, like whether I play or not, that's hitting my bank account. You know what I'm saying? So for him, it's not like an everyday where ah, I'm waking up because I have to do this. And I think that just separates the killers 
from the really, really good basketball players are great. Mm-hmm. I think Joe, Joel Embiid's great, but no, I, he's I great for sure. I wouldn't he's say great. he's a killer because if you, if you're a killer, you're come on, bro. You you're not trying to you're not trying to sit off for no games, man. You trying to you trying to be there for your team. And then the worst thing for me is they have a, a completely not a whole new roster, but they have some key guys like Paul George, and even he's hurt. And, and now, like you said, just establishing that rhythm, like I spoke about earlier, it's going to be difficult, man. Like mm-hmm. these two guys are the corner pieces of the franchise and of the offense and of the defense. And if Philly's already rolling, like you said, with the players they have, then it's like, how do you incorporate, you know, the rest of the group into that corner piece franchise of the market? So it's going to be interesting to see. And I just always find it funny, man, because even k K-Law, K-Law's on their team as well, Kyle Lowry, and he's, you know, been in the NBA for quite some time and it's like okay he's available so it's just like some things I understand you know Joel Embiid is a bigger body so it's like you know more things go into it but at the same time like bro like you again I keep bringing up Anthony Davis I'm like you had the best example besides you and LeBron James so it's like what are you doing off the court what are you doing you know what are your habits uh, in between seasons Mm -hmm. in between games that you're unable to you know show up and show all that work Anthony Davis uh, uh, allowed because last year he played like seven. That's what I'm saying. He, no, he figured it out. He figured um, it out. But also, he also, it also out his, the kind of body he is, how he falls and things like that. Like, I think yeah. that like it, it, a taller guys just get, get a bigger toll, man. They like the, the yeah. nagging injuries, the things that happen like that and the force they play with and stuff like that. So, like I said, like I can't even use Anthony Davis as that benchmark anymore. Joel Embiid is that benchmark for me now. Yeah, oh, that was like, he used to be the benchmark and he figured yeah, it out. He so he needs to. Be. He yeah. said, I don't know who is on that team that or someone that Joel can speak to. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I just think that we have examples of players in the past. Like I, I consider KG type, type of, you know, that kind of body size. And mm-hmm. um, he was and he was a little able slimmer, to, I feel, but yeah, a little slimmer. But I'm saying like he was always hitting the deck and playing with intensity and he was still available. Um, yeah, well, like he, was also, Chandler. he was also a maniac. I'm mad man still. Yeah, so. great. That's what you I'm saying. To, you have to have that kind of mentality. Like not everybody has that. Gene. Yeah, like you have to have like a like a you know cycle, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like, bro, not everybody has it. Not even all the greats have it. But. Yeah, and we can't fault them for that. But yeah, it's, it's yeah, just exactly. unfortunate to see if you're a Philly fan or, or just a fan of basketball because you wanna you wanna see the league's best playing at all times. Mm-hmm. You don't want to see um, a compromised team. Not nah, facts. Um, but no, nah, man. Like we like we always like we said to each other, we can talk basketball all day because that's what we do. But um, but of course, today is about Halloween on the pod. Um, and before we go, go into our first act, I have to ask this one major question. You know what I mean? When I was younger, right? Let's go, let's go, let's go story time with me. Memory lane. Yeah. Um, so when I was younger, I was told and told very sternly that we don't celebrate Halloween because it's the devil's whatever birthday. I've heard that before. I've heard whatever. Mm-hmm. Same. Um, um, so I was unable to participate in Halloween or costumes and stuff like that. Right. Uh, I feel it's, it's more a Caribbean household, but sometimes it's not all Caribbean households. So I wanted to check with you and ask, like, yo, like, were you able to get through those loopholes and be able to <laughs> dress up in Halloween? Uh, no, we actually shared the same mentality with the yep, household I growing so. up. I, um, you know, it's actually funny. It's not funny that I'm older because I'm like, I want to kind of change this tradition. But growing up, we definitely were the house that were, my mom was like, turn off all the lights, park the car in the driveway and pretend you're not home. So you, so we cannot participate in trick or treat. No one's, yeah. no one's ringing our doorbell. And if someone rang our doorbell, everyone be still, all right, they're gone. All right. Say that. <laughs> Go back and do what you're doing. So definitely never really participated in trick or treating growing up. So that was something that, again, when we talk about, the reason why we love movies is because we're able to vicariously live through other people. I think that's why I gravitate towards these Halloween films is because I never got to experience the paranoia of Halloween. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, when it came to dressing up, I feel like, especially at high school, uh, when kids were coming in costumes, you know, my costume, because I wasn't able to go to the costume store and pick up a costume, I just literally put on the basketball jersey. My Vince Carter jersey or my or my Ann Iverson or my Carmelo jersey and just said I'm a basketball player because I just wanted to feel like I was a, a part of a part of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I imagine like, but but this is you every day. I said <laughs> I said I know, bro. But I, I, my mom was not going to take me to the store to get a costume. So yeah. But I want to ask you, was is that like I don't want to get too spiritual on here. This is we're not preaching. But was that ever debunked? I never really did my my research specifically when it came to Halloween when it. No, nah, I actually didn't do. Also, I never did my research, but given 
because uh, we you know I mean we are we're accustomed sometimes in church for certain recitals, plays, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, but I think it's just the the subject matter, right? More than the actual subject, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because the witchcraft, um, the devil, yeah, the stuff, witchcraft, like all that stuff. I don't know. Like I said, I don't want to speak definitively, but I definitely want to say that I um, think that it was because of the things. You know, I mean, we're glorifying horror. Or glorifying that kind of stuff. That's why. But you don't have to glorify it to enjoy it. You don't have to glorify it to, you know, I mean, acknowledge it even. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing today. So, I also like the fact that you could just dress up and be somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Everybody who who doesn't, I mean, that's literally what acting is, right? In a yeah, sense, where you're able true. to change your appearance and take on a different persona. Obviously, you don't want to take it too far with certain costumes. But mm-hmm. at the same time, I, I, I always like marveled at the fact that I have friends that were really, or even now, now that we're older and we know couples out there who are really creative and like, yo, we're going to be this and we're going to show up like this and pop out at parties like this together. I think mm-hmm. it's a cool process. So when you have your future household um do you think you're going to participate in halloween in terms of dressing up or having parties or even offering trick-or-treating um i will do more of my research on it um Mm -hmm. and uh, come to a conclusion on that or a solution um but for the most part i have like lightly participated in it and uh this thursday uh today actually um, I'm going to get the opportunity to trick or treat with my niece. So, um, yeah, so I don't know. I think that it just depends. You know what I mean? I, I, if you look at it in a certain way, then it's that way. But if you look at it as like, yo, it's just a day of dressing up, then yeah. But granted, again, it's about the subject matter. So, um, just we'll definitely have to do more research on that. So, but, uh, but with that, we're going to come to the end of act, I mean, intro, and then we're going to head into act one after this media timeout. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Seeing DMs. Issue 50. Big time 50. Um, but no, we were talking about Halloween today. So I wanted to ask before we dive into what we're going to be talking about today. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel like there are plenty of Halloween themed movies or do you feel like it's not the same? Cause, uh, my little brother, Micah, uh, actually asked me that the other day when I told him that this is what we're talking about. He said, yo, is there more Christmas themed movies or Halloween themed movies? And I had to actually think because I was like, wait, there's horror films, but there's not that many horror films that are tied to Halloween. You know yeah. what I mean? That's but, the caveat. So that, that's, that's, when you that's separate that's, horror from Halloween, that makes a difference. But if exactly. you talk about horror, there's a plentiful amount of horror films. There's even a there's this thing called Shudder, and I'm pretty sure it's a streaming service that's strictly mm-hmm. for horror films. So, but then when you talk about you know actual Halloween, you know, that takes place movies, around the area mm-hmm. on the yeah, town, no, yeah, I think Christmas beats it hands down. Hands down. That's what I thought too. I, I also told him about that. I said that, uh, um, Christmas is such a bigger holiday. Um, that I think that they know that it's more of a money grab. Cause back in the day, these movies would come out and people would go see them on Christmas. People would go see them da da da, or see them before Christmas, whatever the case may be or around Christmas. But for Halloween, yeah, we can go see movies around Halloween. We can do all that stuff. Yeah. But I mean, Halloween is not like a season. It's just a, a like a day like yeah. Christmas 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 holiday is like a season it's like a whole week essentially yeah, you, you know, have like, um you have guys like you who be counting down from oh day damn one. right <laughs> damn right best time of the year bro and that's why that's why well that's why I try to get all my hate out all during the year and then December is just all love so um uh, I, I barely am in a bad mood in December barely um um if ever so yeah bro so nah I just had to ask that question real quick because I, I wanted to confirm that for my bro but i know that there's obviously some movies that we'll discuss today that are uh take place during that but yeah. today we will be doing our our personal and i want to repeat this personal <laughs> top 10 favorite horror films or even films in our opinion um so uh that's what we'll be doing today again i want to just uh, repeat this repeat this uh three four times personal <laughs> And a personal. Granted, we have not, me personally, have not seen all the horror movies of all time. But mm-hmm. from the horror movies I have seen, 
these are the these are some of the picks. So we're going to do a top 10 and we're going to start in act one with 10. We're going to go backwards 10 to six, both of us. And then in the in act two, we're going to work our way down to number one. So we're going from our 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 most favorite to like our our most favorite is what you're saying. I guess. I mean, yeah. I guess most favorites is insane, but yeah, if it's a ten, <laughs> top 10, yes, it yeah, is yeah. favorite. So okay, yes. I'm just making sure with the ranking. You know, I didn't want to start no, out with a banger. Right, you're I'm right. like, okay. So, do mm-hmm. uh, give us your 10 to 6. Um, I feel like Merv said a big Merv pause because, you know, a lot of these movies were not allowed to watch as a kid. I was not allowed to watch as a kid. And I definitely came from a household where, you know, going to Blockbuster, I mentioned this before on the pod where me and my brother Cinco, it was like pick one movie each and a video game each from Blockbuster type of thing. And I don't recall a lot of horror films being of that subject matter. And as a matter of fact, the horror is more so family and, you know, the haunted house with Eddie Murphy, those type of things, um, more so play play, you know, I know cast with a friendly ghost and everything. So, just doing my research with these movies and having to rewatch them because obviously when you get older, you see some of these movies in passing, whether it's on cable when it was big or reruns like that, or whether you're in university and you actually get the chance to just, you know, fire up your own type of movies, um, depending on what's going on. I think it, it, it really made a difference. But for me, at number 10, I'm going to start off with Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, that movie came out in 1984. It was directed by Wes Craven, who's a, a legendary director, you know, cranks out some heaters still to this day. Um, it was a $1.8 million budgeted movie and it made $57 million. So it definitely did its thing. And I think for me, why I like it is because it's a classic slasher film and it's about several little teenagers in the Midwest who fall prey to Freddy Krueger. Um, and it's, it's the reason why I like it too is because it has to do with nightmares. And I feel like a lot of people have experienced nightmares growing up. Whether you still have them to this day or not, uh, when you were a kid, you definitely had that experience of mm-hmm. going to sleep and then you, you you dream of something that you don't want to dream about. And it's about a disfigured midnight mangler who preys on these teenagers in their dreams specifically, which in turn kills them in reality. After an investigation, the phenomenon, um, you know, Nancy begins to suspect that the dark secret kept by her and her friends' parents may be the key to unraveling the mystery, but you know, can Nancy and her boyfriend, who's also played by Johnny Depp, a young Johnny Depp, solve the puzzle before it's too late? Again, I think it's a high concept. You know what I'm saying? That premise is so elite because all of us go to sleep. All of us have dreams, whether it's good or bad, meaning the nightmares. So to have the actual killer show up only in your nightmare, but then whatever is happening to you at night in your dream also happens in reality, I think is an interesting concept because it reminds me of the Matrix in a sense. Or, you know, in the Matrix, if you die in the Matrix, you, you kind of die in real life. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? A man gets stabbed in the Matrix and then, you know, on the chair, he's oozing blood. And it's like, wait, what? I thought he was just in the game or I thought he was just in the stimulant. So yep. I just kind of like that pattern and the horror vibe of it. I think it, it it's an amazing concept where it's like you question why to go to sleep, go to sleep ever again. As a kid, you're like, should I go to sleep? If I close my eyes and I dream. But there's an important message about it. And I like the fact that basically the solution to the story is... If you aren't scared and you aren't afraid and you don't believe that it's real and you turn your back on, you know, Freddy Krueger, then you'll be able to survive. You die. It's too late, Krueger. I know the secret now. This is just a dream. You're not alive. This whole thing is just a dream. You're nothing. And it sounds simple, but I think it's it's an analogy and a metaphor for a lot of things in life. If you have something that you're fearful in the real world, it's mm-hmm. like, yo, just, you know, if you have a lot of faith and you believe that you're bigger than whatever your fear is, then it won't affect you. It won't impact you. It's kind of like the same thing when you have haters and people are talking bad about you. If you don't give any attention to it, then how could it really affect you? Uh, the one thing I like about it, too, is that it provided an iconic, iconic score with the theme song. And I like that the theme song was used by the rappers Fabulous and Jada Kiss for their album. Some that I still bump to this day, um, yeah, before games especially. But it's got to be on the Mount Rushmore when we're talking about 
the longest or most screams in a film. Like <laughs> when we talk about scream queens and I'll talk about a few <laughs> other films where there's like scream queens, which is a term of the final girl, or the female uh, protagonist who's screaming at the top of her lungs. This is, you know, definitely on the Mount Rushmore in terms of someone who's screaming. And, and I'm talking about you have to cover your ears like, geez, like I get it. Why are you screaming? But Freddy Krueger's whole look and aesthetic with the with the knives for fingernails type of vibe. And again, him just being half, you know, burnt because they they burnt him in a boiler room, I think is all things that are so menacing and haunting that stick with people to this day. No, man, I I, I have to agree. Um, I wouldn't have put it 10 personally, but uh, gone, I have to agree, higher. Man. Yeah, I have it a little higher because how I did my rankings personally, yeah. I did it based on cultural influence as well. Okay. Um, not just about like the scare factor, um, but just okay. cultural influence on either my life or just the life of everybody around. Right. And I feel like that's why, that's it's why, pers- that's the only reason why it's a little, See, a little higher. When I chose my list, I definitely had the scare factor. Um, and then, you know, me again, big director guy. So I think it was more so the scare factor in combination with the direction. Mm-hmm. But I, I definitely know what you're talking about in terms of the cultural impact that it's had because people to this day still dress up as Freddy. And um, even, you know, you think about the red and, and gray or the red and white kind of striped thing that he has in the top hat, like all that is just so memorable. Yeah. No, nah, man. All right. Well, um, continue down your list, bro. What's nine? Oh, I, I, I thought I was going to. All right. I thought yeah, I was going to go 10, 9. ISO, clear out. Yeah, yeah, 7, 6. <laughs> all right. Move on to mine, yeah. All right, so for the next one that I have, I would have to go with Hereditary. It's a more newer one. I don't have a lot of new ones on this list, Mm -hmm. but I think Hereditary came out in 2018, $10 million budget, and we made $87 million, so we did this thing in the box office. And it's essentially about a mentally ill uh, mother who passes away. And, you know, Annie, the daughter, um, her husband, the son, um, and the daughter of Annie, all mourn her loss. And it's incredible because the family turns to different means to handle their grief, which is something that can be applicable to all of our lives. Not everybody deals with grief the same way. And Mm -hmm. I think it's important to have different representations of that. And Annie and her daughter are both flirting with the supernatural. Like it's been signs of it here and there, but they, they don't really fully dabble in it. And they began to have disturbing and otherworldly experiences linked to the sinister secrets and the emotional trauma that has been passed through the generations of the family. And I just like, first of all, it's an immaculate title, Hereditary, because it gets you thinking, okay, what is this? Hereditary are things that can be passed down, Mm -hmm. you know, traits, habits, uh, physical stuff, anything, attributes. And I just love that one. It's an A24 production. So when it comes to these horror films, and I've done my research, I think that the better produced ones were either by Blumhouse or by A24. And it's just like a, it redefined the prestige trauma horror in the film. And that's what I'm talking about. So hereditary kind of serves that the demon serves as a rep- as a rep- as a, rep- a representation of hereditary conditions passed down through generations, whether mm-hmm. it's depression, whether it's addiction, whether it's anxiety, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I think that the woman who played Annie, who was Tony Collette, had a great, strong, big female performance. Yeah, um, she really surprised did. she didn't win a, an award for this, but she's Horror been nominated thing. for a lot of things. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think it's psychological, psychologically complex in the fact that it's very disturbing with all of the beheadings. And Son, when I kind of read, yeah, that first it? one. Man. Oh my goodness, that yeah, accident! Damn. I don't want to spoil it for everybody, but jeez, it, it makes you want to. I know you. I know you have Man, a dog, I was, uh, bro. I had to pause the movie. I was like, "Wait, oh, my goodness!" And, it, and 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 again, I know you have a dog. So when I, if I'm ever driving around with a dog, I miss you want to roll the window hey, a little bit more. Trust, <laughs> trust, man, trust <laughs> me. Don't keep your head in the window, man. But um, it's just like when you rewatch it, you understand that you know the cult is basically seeking a host and its behavior. And when you see all the signs of the beheading, I just think it's a real focal point. And it, it's crazy because. Again, I'm not big into watching trailers similar to you, but when they marketed this movie, you would have thought that the daughter was the main point of the movie. Um, the, the daughter, nice, and, crazy spoilers, you know, but yeah. My fault. But just the fact that she was a part of that accident was just OD. Um, and I just like just the little nuances in terms of how Annie was designing certain things and then 
uh, it, it would, you know, kind of transition to the real life. I also like that she would go to the focus, I mean, to the, the therapy. I like the different camera shots that were involved in, no, in those scenes. And I love just how her husband was like, bro, you're going crazy. And one thing I learned about watching these scary movies and horror films is that if anyone offers you a seance, say no. Respect of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, fine. Release me. Just say it. Just fucking say it. Don't you swear at me, you little shit. Don't you ever raise your voice at me. I am your mother. Do you understand? All I do is worry and slave and defend you. And all I get back is that fucking face on your face. So full of disdain and resentment and always so annoyed. Well, now your sister is dead. And I know you miss her. And I know it was an accident. And I know you're in pain. And I wish I could take that away for you. I wish I could shield you from the knowledge that you did what you did. But your sister is dead. What are we talking about? <laughs> like, no. no. And so, yes. Um, I don't know what you thought about that film, but it's more recent horror film. And I thought it was, you know, creatively done and it was artistically driven, but it was polished. And I think A24 has a great represent, uh, sorry, has a great just history of producing just high quality films on not the biggest budget. No, nah, I think they really are. They are known for it. And that's why anybody, anytime people see an A24 movie, they get amped because they know that A24 does their thing, man. They don't, it's not. Crazy production, but mm -hmm. usually, man, they they really do give out some great products. But uh, but now, what's number eight on your list? All right, so number eight again for the audience out there. I'm kind of going based off a of scare factor in a sense, but this one to me, I'm going with Halloween Four. It came out in 1988, directed by Dwight H. Little, a five million dollar budgeted movie. It made 17.8 million. I'm choosing this one because obviously there's a goaded one that I'll probably have you know a little bit higher in my rankings. But this is the first film that brought back Michael Myers. It's literally called, you know, Michael, the return of Michael Myers, because in the previous film, they tried to start something without him and he wasn't in the film and it just didn't work financially. It didn't work. Um, just from a viewer standpoint, it didn't work. The movie wasn't the greatest. It wasn't good at all. But this movie right here, it's, you know, based on Halloween. And I think that's why I love this franchise is because most of these movies take place around this, 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 this event, this holiday. And yeah. you'd be hard pressed to find other movies that did the same, which I thought was kind of peculiar about just the movie business. Like, how would you not have a movie that's set on Halloween or based around Halloween? Like, how yeah. is this the first kind of iteration of that? But yeah, these that guys makes really sense to me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's October 30th, 1988, and Michael Myers has been in a coma since his last pursuit of Laurie Straw, that was played by, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, the legendary Jamie Lee Curtis. And 10 years ago, he was finally stopped, which happened in the events of Halloween 1 and Halloween 2. And however, he was being transferred from Richmond Mental Institute to the Smith's Grove, where he awakens and hears that he has a niece in Haddonfield and Illinois. After killing the transfer queue, he escapes. And I just love how the movie sets it up because they always talk about Michael and how he's pure evil and this, that, and the third. And then you have, you know, in Haddonfield, the niece who's played by Jamie uh, or her name is Jamie has been adopted by the by a family and she keeps having nightmares about Michael. But she doesn't know who he is. And I just love how when it approaches that it's Halloween night, Jamie goes out trick or treating until little known fact, she finds out that her murderous uncle has been following her, stalking her. That's what he does best, bro. He's like a stock master. Man. <laughs> I'll be appearing in the bushes in the darkness, be appearing in windows and all that. And <laughs> he's literally following her and her stepsister, Rachel. And he's rushing out um, to, to, to try and end this. And I just want to preface this to the audience. I think. Again, I'll talk about the other one later in the rankings, but I think for me, what ruined the franchise was the fact that they try to make Michael related to certain characters and it kind of took away the stakes for me personally. Like, I'm like, come on, bro. Like, why? Uh, how is we find out that that's his sister all of a sudden or now he found out this is his niece? Like, it kind of changes things for me personally. I, I wish it was just like a more of a random attack or he had another type of attraction to wanting to kill them other than the fact that it's his family. Mm -hmm. Um but outside of that, we have Dr. Loomis um, with the help of Sheriff Meeker, who starts to search in the town to find Michael and to protect Jamie. And I, again, I like Dr. Loomis in this because I just think that he serves as that one guy. We talked about it with the alien episode where it's like you always have, you know, with the Sigourney Weaver character where she's like, no, aliens are real, bro. I've encountered them. I know my whole crew's dead off, but y'all have to, you know, trust me. I just put yeah. your wrists out there. 
Loomis is that guy. He's the Dr. Loomis is the guy that's like, bro, Michael's pure evil. Like he always has monologues where he's talking about how, you know, he basically is like, yo, Michael's a devil, bro. Like we can't save him. And whenever he goes to notify the sheriff or the police or whatever, people always take him lightly. I just find that funny in this world when you have someone who's, you know, talking about, and that's a consistent theme I find in these horror films where it's, you'll have somebody who is in the know, who's like, I'm letting you know what the, the evil is coming and what's happening. Everyone's like this cat, like just discrediting them and doubting them. Yeah. And it ends up biting them in the long run because they end up getting murked. And it's like, bro, you should listen to bro. And maybe he wasn't being overprotective or maybe he wasn't crazy. Maybe he was yeah. actually looking out for everybody's safety. I tell you, Michael Myers is here in this town. He's here to kill that little girl and anybody who gets in his way. And assuming what you say is true. It's true, Sheriff. All right, all right, it is true. The hell can we do to avoid a repeat of 10 years ago? Find this little girl, get her someplace safe. Call the local TV station. Tell them to get people off the streets and behind locked doors. Uh, but it, it definitely, again, what's had is cool moments. We have Michael going to the, the Halloween store, the costume store, to get his mask because, you know, he's been burnt up, so he doesn't have his mask anymore. So he had to go get his mask. So just the whole pop culture 80s vibe of, like, having to go to a mom and pop store to get an actual costume, I think it's hilarious in itself. It's like a little funny, dark humor. It's like, bro, had to go to the, the store to get his <laughs> his own identity, which people have marketed off of. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I just like, uh, at the end, cause it was like a little callback to how Michael started his career. I don't want to give it away, but just what Jamie does at the end of the movie is a callback to how we find Michael Myers to be in his origin story. Okay. It's number eight. Number eight. Yeah. How many more? All right. One more or two more? Two more. Two more. All right. <laughs> All right. So after that, I'm definitely going to have to go with it. 2017 this is probably the last like newer age movie that I really rocked with when it came to the horror. Um, there's some other good ones out there, but the ones that I'm going to speak about later, the older films, I just feel like set the precedence for me when it comes to horror. I think that they just really did his job when it came to the genre, but it $40 million budget and made $705 million. So definitely, you know, warranted a sequel, which obviously came out. And it's about recent cases of a disappearing uh, local kids in the town of Derry, Maine. And it follows a group of kids dubbed as the Losers Club in the summer of 1989. The discovery of scary encounters and the shape-shifting demonic entity known as the, the guy who returns every 27 years and preys on your own personal fears. I think it's just a creative spin on horror. And like I said, it kind of reminds me of the Nightmare of Elm Street type of vibe where it's like, yo, if you're... If you have fears and you tap into them, then they're just going to grow. If you feed that, it's just going to continue to grow and evolve and it's going to become you and, and just get the better of you. And the killer is a killer, you know, an evil clown. And that's another thing, too. I think clowns are such a great uh, tactic used to scare people because it's something that you don't see often. Like, I, I personally, Merv, I don't know if you've seen clowns often, but I've never been to, like, the man in his birthday party growing up and someone dressed up as a clown or... Like, I never, like, seen a clown, like, just in person, you know what I'm saying? So I don't know if that was a generational thing or whatever, but if I was to ever see a grown man just as a clown now, I'd be, I'd be freaked out because I'd be like, yo, who does this? Like, what? Like, why are you, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's not a common yeah, thing. Get your Ronald McDonald ass out of my face, man. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, I'm about to say Ronald McDonald and Krusty, what is it, Krusty Clown in, uh, um, in The Simpsons, yeah. like, literally yeah. the only, uh, introduction that I have to clowns when it comes to, to my life. But the fact that Pennywise can shape shift into the thing that you're most afraid of, I think is just super menacing. Um, the movie really explores the themes of, of fear, of abuse, of innocence that's been lost. And it features a young cast of actors that really bring out the reality in the film. And it keeps it grounded. You know, these guys are riding their bikes. These guys are just getting bullied. These guys are having their own banter within each other. And I think it hits a lot of great technical aspects because there's a lot of like low camera angles. And images of these kids on bikes that kind of evoke the early stages of Steven Spielberg's kind of shots, which I thought was cool to kind of pay homage to. And the kids that are always hallucinating in the ways that adults can't see, I think is just a great touch to the movie. Because especially in that scene with Beverly, where she's in her own bathroom and it just gets super bloody. And when her when her pops comes in, it's like, and she's like, bro, you can't see the blood. And he's like, bro, what are you talking about? And then when she invites the other kids over and they see it, it's like, oh, man, like they're really preying on just the kids. Yeah. And, and like I said, I think the casting was brilliant just because the kids really, you know, reflect each other's personalities very, very well, extremely well. And they're very, you know, vulnerable 
and they have insecurities that shine, you know, because they have a lot of kindness and love for each other at the same time. But again, I just think it was one of those things where everybody remembers that opening scene or that first scene because it was played in the trailer as well, too. When I would watch other movies where Pennywise is in the sewage and he's talking to the kid when the boat goes down yeah. the drain and it goes to the sewage. And it's just so creepy the way they played that scene out. And I think it's one of those horrific, you know, you know, scenes that will be remembered for a long time. No, nah, man, it was insane. So I remember that. I remember that movie. First wow. time watching it, I was like, holy. <laughs> um, I'm not supposed to take stuff from strangers. Oh, well, I'm Pennywise the dancing clown. Pennywise? Yes, meet Georgie. Georgie, meet Pennywise. <laughs> now we aren't strangers, are we? But now, what's your number six? All right. So I think for number six, again, because we're going to really like I have some real, real crazy ones, in my opinion, um, that I'll talk about later. Uh, But for number six, if I had to, if I had to, if I had to, I had to, I probably, you know what? For number six, I'm going to go with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, Mm -hmm. Came out in 1974, directed by Tobe. Toby uh, Hooper, and it was a hundred and forty thousand dollar budget, but it made thirty one million dollars. So to say these guys cashed in is is an understatement. Um, it's about when when Sally hears that her grandfather's grave may have been vandalized. She and her paralegic brother actually go on a road trip with their friends to go and investigate. And after a detour to their family's old farmhouse, they discover a group of crazed and murderous outcasts living next door. And as the group is attacked one by one with a chainsaw wielding leather face, who wears a mask full of human skin, by the way, uh, the survivors must do everything they can to escape. Again, this movie to me was so, so, so crazy. Like one, because it was based on (laughs) the real life events of a Wisconsin serial killer named Ed G. And he was the inspiration for other horror films like Psycho and The Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that it was shot on a 16 millimeter millimeter camera because it gives off a feel of a documentary and it makes it feel that more realistic. I also like the fact that the film taught me a lot in the sense of, bro, when you're on a road trip, (laughs) you never pick up a hitchhiker. And that might seem like an overstatement now, but back in the day, it, it was like a regular thing. Like it wasn't, it, really it wasn't was. like, yeah, you know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, don't pick him up. He might be crazy. It's like, oh, that person's in hell. We, we can, might bring him to the next, you know, car, the, the next stop or something like that, or get them closer to their location. And after watching this film, it's like, nah, bro, I'm not taking my chances. You could, you could, you could be, <laughs> I don't care who you are. You could be, uh, Shinsia on the side. I'm not, pick, I'm not picking her up. She could like me down. I'm not picking her yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> she could, she could stay on the side. But I also, learn too is that you never go on a road trip without a full tank of gas because they stopped at the gas station that was obviously you know a small town type of hanky janky type of station and it definitely led to some problems so it's like bro if you if you got the gas bro or if you have to stop and see gas at like a big corporation or so in them places then you better stop there um the film is also credited with being Many elements that are now common in slasher films. So I, I like the influence aspect of it because the use of the power tools is something that we see in other, you know, phenomenon, uh, franchises when it comes to horror films, uh, the mass killer in other face and the fact that he was just violently killing his victims. But I just like that it leaves us in chills when we watch this movie because like the danger is there. And I think that the isolation plays as a character in a sense where when you're somewhere like in Texas and it's like, bro, there's a small town. There's not a lot of places and people that are out there. It's like, how can you get help when you're under attack? Mm-hmm. There's no one else that's around there to help you. I think that's one of the scariest things in the world is like when danger arrives and there's no one there that can be there to assist you. And it's also, like I said, the fact that they're cannibalists, the family's just cannibalists is just like, bro, people eat people like what they make. They make furniture of people's skin. They make human, you know, body parts of, 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 of clothing and everything. And it's just like the scariest thing ever. It's like so sadistic and, and insane. It just adds another quality and height to the level of scariness. And like I said, it emphasizes the final girl aspect in this movie because she ends up prevailing at the end of the film. And she ends up being a survivor. Everybody else dies, but she ends up surviving. And she gives us iconic screams. So again, this is another like scream queen type of vibe. 
Um, I think is the, the summer setting is different for horror films. A lot of horror films that I watched recently and in the past were not take, they didn't take place over the summer. So the fact that this is like the setting for this film, I think makes it an unusually scary environment um, that the movie leans into so well. And it utilizes the grassy fields, the dusty roads, and the scorching backdrop as the atmosphere and premise for it to take place. Um, I think the, the film's heat is also like a secondary character too, right? Because it just feels like it's so heavy. It feels oppressive and it, it feels like you're being held down the same way that Sally is being, you know, contained by Leatherface. And I just think everybody can relate to having summer fun activity with their friends or going on a road trip. So it just makes it that more daunting and horrifying that that can happen to anybody. And the one thing I'll say about this, lastly, is that the film has less blood and guts than most other horror films. So it's not like, oh, super scary in terms of blood and guts and gore. But by stripping away that glamour and beauty of cinema, by giving it that kind of documentary feel, because the camera makes it look like it was done by, you know, us or as an independent type of film, it really makes the story feel more personable and, and more intense. Hello! And in the 70s, horror films were aimed more at realism than it was at fantasy. I feel like that's a problem now with some of the horror films that I watch now. It's like they're too, they're too much in this fantasy world. Whereas these films are like, nah, this could happen, bro. Like this could happen to you. You could, you can get lost on a road trip and, and make the wrong turn and run into somebody that is doing things that nobody could save you from because <laughs> it's their small town. And I think it was just in the era of filmmakers that pushed the boundaries of storytelling and created films that lasted an impact forever. So that's that's probably my list right there for the first couple of rankings of my films. Mm, good, good six through 10, solid six through 10. Um, I think you have some good picks. Um, so on to my picks for number 10, um, I'm gonna go with the 1984 film Gremlins. Mm. <laughs> I have to give them, I'm gonna give them some love. Just for cultural basis, and also when I was a child, when I watched this, when I was a kid, it was terrifying. Um, but Gremlins pretty much follows a story about uh, the perfect Christmas present that turns bad. Um, teenage Teenager Billy gets a present from his dad, um, and his dad gets this present from just a random person. Um, I forget. I forget. Um, Randall Petzer is what it says. That's his name. Um, I think Randall is his father, though. Let's just double check. Yeah, Randall is his father, I believe. But anyways, his father runs and gets him a, a gift. And the person that gave the father the gift said, there's three things. It's a furry pet. But there's three things. that There's three rules you cannot break. Like These are like detrimental rules. Mm -hmm. One... Can't be in sunlight. It can't be in any bright light. Two, can't have any water or be around any water. And three, eat food after midnight. Being a young teenager and all that stuff, do we actually listen to the rules? No, nah, we don't. No, the rules um, are meant to be broken. <laughs> exactly. So when uh, the young the, the 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 young creature uh, starts to get a little hungry. Or first, the, the bright lights, he has to turn off all the lights in the room when he tries to get it out. Then the little creature gets hungry, so he feeds the creature, not knowing what time it is. And then on top of that, he spills some water on the creature's back. And all these little balls start popping out of the creature's back. And he's like, what are those? And they're like just other versions of him. But <laughs> the evil versions um, of the evolution of, of, of um, these creatures where they then go on a rampage and terrorize and murk the entire town. When one of the evil ones finds out that he can multiply himself by getting wet, he decides to drench himself. I think he jumps into the pool, if I remember correctly, or jumps into a fountain, and he gets, pops out bare babies, as they would say, I guess. And, um, and yeah, and then they go through terrorizing the town until the end of the movie where they're finally able to to kill all of them. 
Um, but no, nah, man, I think as a young kid, I watched that and it was terrifying because I was young, one and two of just underneath my bed, looking at for anything. If anything went out, the lights went out, I look around the room and check if there was a gremlin around or any of that stuff. Like it was always just like, yo, they're quick. You can barely see them sometimes and they're just dangerous, man. So I was just terrified for that. So that's, that comes in at number 10. <laughs> oh, what is it? No. It's your new pet. Come on, Bonnie, be a good dog. You're kidding. Dad, it's, it's really neat. Where did you get this? Oh, some little junk store in Chinatown. Uh, number nine on my list has to be a uh, newer movie. That's why I had to give it a nine. But also culturally, it was a classic. And that would have to be Get Out, uh, produced by Jordan Peele. It follows the story of a young man who's going out with a girl. Um, his name is Chris, Chris Washington, as he's going out with this girl named Rose. Um, and he's going down to, uh, to meet her family. You know what I mean? Go over there, meet her family, eat, have a grand old time. You know what I mean? Um, and they're rich or well off. Mm -hmm. So when he pulls up, there's a long driveway. Um, they have drivers, they have all types of stuff. This is bro, they just made him money. So, so a couple of weird things happen, man. Like he sees a couple of the, the, the workers outside and the, the maid inside, the help, as they would say, are black. And she's like, oh, he's like fitting, of course. Um, and obviously they're white. And then when he goes inside and he all this stuff, like things, just weird things keep happening. He sees this random guy that he remembers, but he can't remember where he's from. He sends the picture to his friend. His friend's like, yo, that's thing, thing, thing. And he's like, yo, that's crazy. Cause when he took a picture of him, he started freaking out and telling him to get out. So, uh, title of the movie. Um, then we go down a whirlwind of emotions, finding out that the family actually, uh, auctions off black men that Rose brings home. Black men are black women, black women that Rose brings home so that they can swap the brains of the old white people, put them into the young black people and live out their lives uh, in the skin of a young black woman or man uh, because of the advancements of that they believe of, of black people and everything like that. They feel like they are their best candidate to to further their goals as a family and as a community so they use yeah black people as their surrogates i guess that they would say obviously a classic uh classic movie that that uh came out in 2017 I actually thought it was a lot later than that only been seven years since it came out which is insane uh but it it shone a light on some of the things that uh black people think um and uh some of the things that obviously to a certain degree happen behind closed doors um so i think it was really good it was a horror film that was like horror but also like dark comedy like psychological horror so that's why i put it in here because it's still horror but psychological so that is get out 2017 and that's my number one number nine pick not number one the chores have become my sanctuary Get out. Sorry, man. Okay. Get out! Yo! No! Yo! Chill, man! Get out! Chill! Get out! Chill! Chill, man! Get out! 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 On my number eight pick, classic, of course, of course, Jordan Peele classic. Eight pick, have to give it to the classic, um, and one of the the ones to push the genre forward of horror and, and to different heights was Saw. Oh. Saw as a horror film, have to give it to it, came out in 2004. Um, how a movie starts off, two men awaken and find themselves on opposite sides of a dead body. And they are given 
suspicious. Oh my gosh. Specific, <laughs> Jesus. Specific instructions to kill the other or face consequences. Um, and when they go through all these trials, they kind of do flashbacks, talk about their life. They kind of just remember, they start talking a little more and they realize that they are connected in some way. And, um, and they like have to go through v- vigorous different things to try to figure out how to escape. Um, eventually doing things that like humans would only do to escape when there's no other option. Uh, I'm speaking of 128 days. Um, <laughs> was that, is that, was that 26 days? No, no, 128 days. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the movie ends with, uh, them finding out that the actual person that put them there and also the person that is the jigsaw, the person that set this all up was the dead fake guy that was beside them the entire time and fake mm-hmm. blood and a fake uh, head costume and everything like that. So, um, and he does all, he does all this as a way of revenge in a way. He thinks that if you're not being a good person, you're not living the life you're supposed to be living. He is a judge. So he uh, proclaims himself God essentially. Um, but saw, yes, came out 2004, changed the genre of horror films as a whole. Um, as we know it, uh, turned way more gory and way more dark. No one can hear you. What the fuck is this? Calm down. Just, just calm down. Are you hurt? I don't know. Yeah. What's your name? My name is very fucking confused. What's your name? What's going on here? My name is Lawrence Gordon. I'm a doctor. I just woke up here, just like you. Uh, that's my number eight. And coming in at number seven is the classic grudge. The grudge. Um, the grudge came out in 2004. Um, and it was starring Sarah Michelle, Sarah Michelle Geller, who we all know is Buffy, the vampire slayer. Um, who was also in, uh, no, she wasn't. Uh, that was a uh, Jennifer Love Hewitt, sorry. Um, <laughs> But an American nurse living in and working in Tokyo is exposed to a mysterious supernatural curse, one that looks uh, looks a person, locks a person in a powerful rage before claiming their life and spreading to another victim. Sounding a lot like um, it follows. Um, it takes place in Tokyo because the movie actually is a remake of a Japanese movie um, um, made before then. And it it is an interesting one because I think it also puts the agenda of, of different demonic things, but also in different countries. Usually when we talk about this stuff, it's usually in America, mm-hmm. it's usually in places that we are very well versed in, usually. Um, but in this one, this is, takes place in a different country where we don't usually see and we don't usually think that horror, you know, I mean, comes, comes to play. So, um, that changed everything. I, and also changed everything for the better in the sense that Japanese movies were getting remakes, horror films were getting remakes in America. Um, so yeah, that's what I'll put at my number seven, The Grudge. Coming in and the last place before our, our media timeout is the classic, and I mean the classic, The Hills Have Eyes. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ. That movie came out in 2006. And my Lord, that movie. Um, while celebrating their 30th, we- uh, 30th any, uh, wedding anniversary, a couple are traveling through the desert with their three children, son-in-law, and their baby granddaughter. When they end up at a gas station, i.e. like Dwayne said, um, never go to a gas station. They end up at a gas station. The worker there told, tell them, told them, in quotes, there is a shortcut they could take throughout these hills. And like the title says, the hills blood cleat have eyes. <laughs> All right. And what happens is that these the uh, cannibal family, um, a group of people, come down and essentially kill every last one of the people there and uh, try to eat them, but also try to rape them to make their own babies, to make more babies of that sort. It's a very disgusting film, 
Very terrifying. I hate their skin. I hate everything about it. But man, that movie is insane. Um, definitely a horror film. Definitely one that I think about when I go on long distance drives and I have to drive through any mountain, any peaks or any area that I do not like. So that is um, uh, a classic for sure. But that ends off my 10 to 6 list. And we'll be back after this quick media timeout to further our, our list and bring it down to number one. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Act two, season four, season three, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, <laughs> issue 50. Uh, welcome back. We're talking about Halloween and horror films today. And we're going to finish off our, uh, finish off our top 10 list of horror films. And the win is up. So go with your number five, brother. All right. For number five, I'm going to go. I already mentioned it a few times because I spoke about the fourth installment in the franchise. But I'm definitely going to go with Halloween. Yeah. Halloween came on 1978, $300,000 budget. It made $47 million, but that's not even, I don't even think, I think that's accurate to like the year. But since then, it's, it's amassed so much money because of all the remakes and the sequels and the prequels and whatever. Um, but it, it's basically 15 years after murdering his sister on Halloween night in 1963, which was a crazy scene in the beginning because it was a POV view of Michael as a child. And you just hear him breathing. He has a knife and it's after a, a, a sex scene or a scene where a female, her sister and I mean, his sister and uh, her, her man, you know, engage in coitus. And then after that, she's like, Michael. And then he comes with the knife, which is pretty intense. <laughs> uh, Michael escapes from a mental hospital and returns to his small town of Hayden's Field, Illinois. Um, to kill again. <laughs> what else does he want to do? And I think it influenced a generation of Halloween films. Uh, I like the fact that it introduced the unlikable evil, which is Michael and the fact that he never dies. There's so many, like, when I look back at wrestling and I, I love the Attitude Era, but especially when Undertaker kind of took on his, his peak and his prime, he did the Michael Myers all the time where he just like sat up. He was just laying down on his back and then he would just sit up. And I thought, I thought that was so suspenseful because that's what Michael Myers did. Just when you thought you stabbed him, just when you thought you've killed him, just when you thought you shot him, man gets back up. It's like he was, he was like Deadpool, bro. He had the, the gene. And I just like the fact that it was suspense and fear over bloody gore. Again, I'm not a big gory person when it comes to horror movies. I kind of like the psychological, like, psychological aspect of it. So for me, I just think that they really played into that well. And never before has there been a movie with the title Halloween surrounding the holiday. So again, I alluded to that before and it's crazy to think about that. Like, yo, the history of films that we had and nobody thought about, hmm, like, let me make a movie called Halloween. Like, I, I never, I don't know what executives or producers or directors were doing back in the day, writers, but it's like, bro, this is a gold mine sitting right there. And we talked about how sometimes the simplicity of the title can how much make the film. And I think that this is an example of this right here. Um, again, it introduced the final girl aspect of having Jamie Lee Curtis's character, Laurie, survive at the end, even though everybody else got murked. Uh, it had a cheap indie feel, which again is a similar theme of some of the other movies I talked about, which kind of gives it that, that glimmer and shine. You don't want your, your horror films to have a big budget, like polish type of, depending on the theme or tone you're going for. And I also really enjoyed the fact that Michael can hide in plain sight because his uniform is just what, like a painter's costume and it's a mask. It like on Halloween, you wouldn't be like, yo, that's a serial killer. You would just be like, oh, it's somebody dressing up for Halloween. And and that's why he was able to hide in plain sight. There's so many times throughout that holiday in this movie where he could have been seen like he was driving a car in the station wagon behind Laurie and them or he was in the bushes or he was in the window and maybe somebody saw him, but they're probably just thinking like, all right, bro, this is Halloween. Like, I'm not going to, I'm not really pressed about it. Even in the modern day today, like I'm not trying to give anybody the battery to go do anything, but mm -hmm. if he was a, a killer and you were in a Michael Myers costume, like on Halloween and you're walking down the street, no one would call the cops. They wouldn't be like, oh my God, who is this man? Like, or this woman walking down the Michael Myers costume. Yeah. They'd just be like, oh, is somebody just dressing up for Halloween. Now, yeah. if, you that, if you do that in like, in like August or like September, like that's a little suspect. Yeah, 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 you do it any other time. Then <laughs> like, like, oh, now we're for sure. Right, yeah, it's a weirdo yeah. on the block, bro. Yeah, Come check yeah, this out. Facts, but facts. I just, I just love that he took advantage of that. 
Um, cause I think it's so cool. Cause you, like when you can't identify your enemy, it makes it all that much harder for him to defeat. And then I like the POV perspective. I just spoke on it when he was a kid, but throughout the whole movie, it transitions back to when Michael is breathing heavy. And I like that the, the score of the movie is something that we just know that piano hits and everybody knows that score. I love that it's so simple. It's like, yo, when John Carpenter really, you know, introduced the score. It's like every time he played that piano, you knew that danger was lurking around the corner. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and if it wasn't there, you just had that sense of it. You were just like kind of your skin was tingling because you're like, yo, I hear the music. That means that something bad is about to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just love that that incorporation into the movie. I thought it was creepy and frightening. So that would have to be my number five right there. Um, for number four, I'm going to go... Yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to do that. For number four, I'm going to have to go with another kind of, I guess, now nah, I wouldn't even say newer, but they definitely try to make remakes. And I think there's a new one coming out soon. But the Blair Witch Project came out in 1999. Mm. Man, this story is so crazy because it was a $200,000 to $750,000 budget and it made $748 million. So Boy, oh boy. But I'll talk about the Jeez. details of how people got paid at the end of this because I feel bad for people involved. But it's basically about In Search of a Local Legend, three bold Great amateur stuff. documentary students, director Heather, cameraman Josh, and sound recorder Mike hike into Burkittsville, gloomy Black Hills Forest to find a shadow. The fabled Blair Witch. Now, one year later, after their fateful demise, October 1994, there's still no sign of the students and filmmakers apart from the raw footage that they left behind. Who knows what truly happened during their creepy five-day journey into the mountain and mouth of madness. And man, it was crazy because indeed there was intangible supernatural presence in the dark woods that led to the team's disappearance. But either way, the trio have gone missing and it's up to us, basically the viewers, to figure out what happened. Could it have been nightmarish? Was it a myth? Was it real? And I have a lot of things to say about this movie, Murph. And one of them is it really foreshadowed how people act nowadays in the sense that everybody utilizes their cell phone and their cameras and, and tend to video record their movements, whether it's the simplest things. We've been doing that since Snapchat. We've been doing that. You know, we, we have family home videos of your mom having the, the camcorder on your birthday, yeah. just recording you doing simple things. So just having that whole, you know, now we're in a day and age where people are obsessed with true crime. I mean, you mm -hmm. just we were at my mom's house the other day. She talks about how she could she loves watching these true crime type shows, but she'd be the last person to walk the streets. You know what I'm saying? When the sun, yeah. Is yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like make it make sense. But people are obsessed with the true crime stuff, and this got the ball rolling. Where at the time of the peak, where both it was a mixture of the internet starting to become a prevalent thing in '99. You know, the whole Y2K thing and also the pop culture fascination with true crime, like I just mentioned. And it influenced the whole generation and genre of found footage. And found footage is a genre that really symbolizes films like Paranormal Activity, Late Night with the Devil, The Last Exorcism, Cloverfield, End of Watch, VHS, Creep, Sinister, Willow Creek, Searching, etc. that found success in it. But the found footage era is basically a unique, a unique style of, of, of filming that presents the film as if it's a real footage recorded from participants that, you know, are later found uh, and presented to be unedited. And the found footage often uses cinematic techniques like first person perspective, mockumentary and news footage or surveillance footage as a style of, of getting its point across. And so it's kind of dope. But now let me talk about the, the cast members. This is like actually pretty sad stuff. I actually feel bad for them. But Heather Donahue, Michael Williams and Joshua Leonard's careers really got impacted negatively from doing this movie. And here's how. Because in 1999, for the promotion, the promotion of this film, um, the marketing campaign listed the three actors of missing or deceased. So they were actually on posters missing and deceased. Now you gotta picture yourself in 1999. There's no social media. There's no, you know how like everyone loves Love is Blind right now, right? You, when you, when you participate in Love is Blind, they tell you you can't be on your phone because they don't want to, you don't, they don't want you to give it away that you're on the show or what's happening on the show. Mm -hmm. Like back then there was no, there was no, like 
there was nobody to be able to confirm if these people were actually dead or alive. So that was like a real thing in real life where people were like, yo, I have to go see this movie because like this has to be real. These men are actually missing. They're actually dead or they, there's something happened to them. There was no like fact checking. There was no like going on Google and being like, yo, no, I just saw that guy post last week. He's all good. Like <laughs> these guys, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. they told them not to go to no premieres. They told them not to go to no screenings. So the actors actually kind of like disappeared off the face of the earth. So they did their job in marketing at a high, at a high value. And instead of using fictional names, all three actors use their real names in the film. Something that Donahue has regretted doing because she revealed in 2014 that since then she's had trouble finding new roles because of it, which makes sense because they got, they got pigeonholed to that movie and to that role. So it's like, why would we cast, you know, Heather Donahue in this movie when Heather Donahue was a main in the Blair Witch Project? Like, mm-hmm. how are people going to identify the difference? Um, then the actors themselves, man, they received a very, very, very small amount compared to what the film gross. I mean, in an email, uh, they said that they got paid 1000 for two weeks of work. In addition, the actors were eventually paid 300000 when they were bought out of their 1% stake. So effectively, they were shut out of any future residuals. So like I said, imagine the whole film, it made, you know, $700 million and all they got from it was 300,000, bro. Well, 300,001. Like, come on, bro. They got, they got ripped off and it, and it was because they weren't represented by the union at the time that they signed their contracts. Actors weren't represented by the union. So they kind of got stiffed and they continue to fight for more compensation and rituals to this day. Even just this year in April, 2024, the actors released a statement and an open letter calling for retroactive and future payments, as well as consultation on any upcoming reboots for the franchise. So it's just like a bad beat, man. They really contributed to like a dope time in history and something that, like I said, has cultivated a lot of films, but they didn't really get compensated for it. So that's sad. That's it's real sad to hear. But like I said, I think that movie is real, you know, creepy in the fact that it's like, again, found footage. Okay. Yeah, even how it ended was just like the the girl screaming, then the camera dropping, and it's just like, bro, what, what happened, bro? Like mm-hmm. it adds to the legend and the myth of whatever. Yeah. Um, for my next film, what am I on three? Yeah. For three, man, this one is tough, but I think I'm going to go with The Exorcist. The Exorcist came out in 1973, directed by William Fredkin. And it was a $12 million budgeted movie and it made $444.1 million, AKA $1.8 billion in Damn. today's day. So <laughs> talk about these Marvel films. That was like a Marvel film back then. And it's about a visiting actress who was visiting Washington, DC. And she notices a dramatic and dangerous change in the baby the behavior and physical makeup of her 12 year old daughter. Meanwhile, a young priest at a nearby Georgetown University begins to doubt his faith while dealing with his mother's terminal illness. And a frail and elderly priest recognizes the necessity for a showdown with an old demonic enemy. So there's a lot of things there that are relatable in the, in the premise alone, with one of it being, you know, the Georgetown, I mean, sorry. Yeah, the Georgetown priest that is dealing with his mother's sickness and is, is struggling with his faith. And I know a lot of people who are into faith feel that sometimes where it's like, why me? If, you know what I'm saying? If I'm serving you, God, then what, how are these things happening to me? And then you start doubting and it's like, nah, you don't, you shouldn't doubt. You should never mm-hmm. doubt. But he had to go through that. But it's groundbreaking. I mean, we talk about, you know, you said, yo, why this person didn't win the award because it's horror. But this is the first horror to get nominated for an Oscar. Um, the appeal to black audiences specifically in all races was super influential because back then they were always like, yo, let's make, we're going to make a Jackie Brown for black people. We're going to make a, I mean, Jackie Brown was later, but you know what I mean? We're going to mm-hmm. make a, this type of movie for this audience. But back then it was like, no, everybody can enjoy this movie. There was tests being done, studies being done and people passing out and fainting during the theater of watching okay, this film. That's, okay, that's it's crazy, crazy. Um, it was super influential in the fact that it felt like a documentary again, but 
the practicality was the main part of it, like the locations for the cities when it came to Iran, when it came to Georgetown, Washington, when it came to New York, like all of these scenes were done in the city. It wasn't like we're at a studio in L.A. trying to recreate this city. It looked like it, though. I, it did, but it was really like the actual places they were traveling to. And I appreciate that about back then where it's like, now nah, we got a budget, bro. We going here. We're going to get this done. Um, the sound designs for this movie are just incredible, like super incredible. The sound designs in this movie was super unsettling because they boost a certain type of ambient noise during the mix, whether it was the dogs fighting or whatever. It's like it's always turned up high. Um, the piano score again is so iconic. And I, I'm, I'm finding that as a similar theme where it's like, if you want a horror movie to hit, you gotta have a certain note on the piano or you gotta have a theme song rhythm that you can always get back to when it comes to the danger in the background. Um, there's a lot of usage of stairs and hills symbolizing heaven or hell. So they have the priest constantly ascending, which is an intentional thing by the director. And then I also found out too, that Marlon Brando and Jack Nicholson were both up for the role of the priest of Father Karras, but they, the director wanted a lesser known actor and not movie stars. So we talk about that sometimes where it's like, bro, this person might be too big and bring too much of their star quality to the role. So we want to have lesser actors and actresses, but the actors and actresses involved really knocked out the park. And man, boy, oh boy, was this movie scary. Like it, 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 it got to me. Some of the stuff the daughter was saying, Reagan, oh man, it was insane. And, we talk about how, you know, certain movies say the title's name in the movie. Well, this movie was the type of movie where it's like, okay, something's wrong with the daughter. So they're going to go get tests done. And they're just passing it off as, oh, it might be depression. Oh, it might be this. It might be that. It might be this. And then we do these different tests. Like she has a spinal tap, bro. And they figure out like, bro, everything's fine with her brain. Has to be something else. Shaking in the bed. That's doubtless due to muscular spasms. Oh, no, 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 that was no spasm. Look, I got on the bed. The whole bed was thumping and rising off the floor and shaking the whole thing with me on it. Mrs. McNeil, the problem with your daughter is not her bed. It's her brain. It's like then we finally make it to the big showdown of The Exorcist. And mm-hmm. that's what the title of it's called. So you have like a whole, you know, final scene of The Exorcist. I like the movie, too, because it's not definitive in its ending where it's like, yo, what happened? The demonic was she making it up the, with the demonic transfer from her to the priest. And like where what happens? And one thing I'll say about this movie, too, to end this note, is that the scene where the elderly father, the priest who comes to perform The Exorcist, who actually starts the film when he's in Iran, which I also think we take it for granted nowadays, too, is like we like to rush into too many things. But in this film, they kind of slowly set the table for, you know, the impact of his appearance later, I think was incredible that when he came out of the taxi and before he like walked into the house, that vision and picture and imagery is literally the title card and the the movie poster of the movie. So just having him like, you know what I'm saying? Come out the car, yeah. top hat on, looking towards the house, like, the nice fluorescent blue lighting with the black, black kind of eerie night backdrop is him um, walking towards the house. And that was the makeup of the movie poster. So I always appreciated that as a director. I'm just like, bro, that's just spot on stuff right there. Because nowadays, I feel like people like have photo shoots. They, they go and they shoot separate things for the movie title. It's not yeah. always like, oh, that was a scene from the movie. Yeah, which is yeah, the movie yeah. Title, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's facts. So. For, for number two, this is a tough one. But I'm going to go with The Poultry Guys. Came out in 1982. Get again directed by Tobe Hooper. Um, and it was budgeted at $10.7 million and it made $121 million. Now, this was interesting, Merv, because although <laughs> it was inferred that Steven Spielberg, who wrote and produced the film, Loki directed it, um, it was kind of a weird thing because I'm just like, bro, what? But he and if you know his filmmaking style, then you understand that he most likely agree with this theory because apparently. He was there every day on the set with the actors and all the people who were involved said that he's the one that literally, you know, creatively had his hands all over it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why. I don't know if it's because Tobe Hooper uh, was involved in making another movie that I just mentioned in the, in the other acts. So maybe it's like, oh, he had his hand on 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 certain things. So he's want to add it for clout. Um, he made Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But I don't know why Steven Spielberg didn't want to take the credit. Uh, for what he did, but everybody's saying he's the reason why. And like I said, when you watch the movie, you're like, oh, this is definitely a Spielberg shot, or this is a Spielberg type of sequence. Yeah. And it's basically about a young family who are visited by ghosts in their home. At first, the ghosts appear friendly, moving objects around the house and to the amusement of everybody. 
but then they turn nasty and start terrorizing the family before they kidnap the youngest daughter. Now, this is why this movie is, is super scary to me. One, it's a family horror that masks itself as it's drama. So it's like, you can watch it with your family to a certain degree, depending on how old they are, because it's not like uber, uber, uber scary. But yeah. at the same time, it's like, okay, it's like simple stuff going on here. It has memorable chemistry between the family. The acting is absolutely outstanding. And the whole cast did their thing. The film makes me scared to leave the TV on. Like, I know some people who sleep with the TV on, and I'm a victim of it too, because sometimes you fall asleep. But I'll be damned if I wake up to go pee in the middle of the night and I see my TV on and I don't feel unsettled because of this film. Like that's how much of an impact this film has on like when you leave the TV on. Now there's some differences because back then they call it snow on the TV where it's like, you know, when the TV, um, just like, yeah, it's off, but it's yeah, like, so, so yeah, there's, there's no yeah, connection. There's no connection. No connection. Right. I think in our era, it was like the, the discolored, uh, a different color yeah, channel yeah, yeah. that had nothing playing on it. Yeah, yeah the, the, the connection was still. I still had those kind of channels too. Mm-hmm. So. so it's like when you just hear the snow and the fuzziness of it, and then it's like the demons calling the girl's name. She's walking towards the TV, and she literally gets trapped inside the television. Like the image is out there is crazy. Um, so I think that was like a very creepy thing there. But it's literally considered a masterpiece because it has a great story, acting, the special effects, and the sense of humor. Like mm-hmm. the part where little girl loses her bird um, and she's like, and they're burying her at the, at the funeral. And she's like, can we get a goldfish now? Like, I thought that was like funny, like little scenes like that. Um, the movie features an impressive like amount of special effects, including floating furniture and the giant screaming skull. Uh, it also blends two separate types of exorcism climaxes. So it's like when you have two different storylines where you can land the plane on both, it always adds to the movie. Um, and there's like a whole bunch of creepy stuff. Like when she announces they're here, like that stays in my head for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, the TV people are here and the rest of the family has no idea what they're in for. The furniture moves. The dog is barking at, at people who aren't even there. The weather gets stormier. It's top tier horror because it meticulously balances like the two sides of fear and beauty and the yeah. aspect of the unknown. Like there's times where the spirits are haunting and they come into sight and the expressions of the characters are a mixture of like straight terror, but also amazement. You know what I mean? Like there's a part where the, the wife's like, yo, honey, look at this and do it again, do it again. And the chair moves and it's like, bro, you're that's dumpy things, bro. Yeah, and you're gassing it. You're gassing it. Like, and I feel like I don't want to make this a race thing, but as black people and, and Marlon Wayans did a great job of, of, of using this trope in his haunted house, uh, parody stuff is like, yo, this house has ghosts. <laughs> Chick, I'm out of here. Like, it's like I'm not even trying to play around and talk to the ghost fam. Like, yeah, you, know, yeah. you said ghost ghosts? Yeah, ghost ghosts. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, you're over here. She's over here. Like, honey, look, look, the ghost moved the chair. And it's like, bro, that's not. That's not funny or cool. Like, yeah, no, that's not something like, to be amped about. Like, pack up the house. We're out of here. Like, no. Um, like I said, it was, it was Steve and Diane's first reaction when they realized what was going on in their home. They weren't even scared, bro. They were excited and intrigued, which is like, again, that's some, some white stuff right there. I ain't gonna lie. And even though it was, uh, a couple, like, there's like a body horror scene halfway through the last 20 minutes of it. Um, it's pretty savage, but it doesn't really depend on these moments. Like movies nowadays, I feel like do, a lot and it's because of their lack of storytelling but in this movie Poltergeist is so confident in his strong script that it doesn't do all that to rely on cheap scares like there's definitely some jump scares and there's some things that you know have great effect but at the same time it's like it's rooted and based in the storytelling and the screenwriting and the last thing I'll say about this movie is I didn't realize in the 80s that parents were rolling up that gas (laughs) because <laughs> like in the beginning of the movie, the parents were in the room, the husband and wife, and they were smoking weed. And they had a funny scene where the husband is not, he didn't know how to roll. And he was like, ask his wife to roll for him while she's already smoking a joint. And I was just like, bro, I didn't think in the 80s they were doing that. And then also in Halloween, they were smoking and driving uh, a joint as well. So I'm like, hmm, that's, that's like, you know, when they talk about things that's always it. come back. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> interesting. I didn't know that bad were doing that because I know people who do that today. Um, 
Uh, so again, I just think it really grounds the film because like, bro, this could happen to any family. This horrific event could happen to any family. Uh, I have to go for number one, bro. That was a long one, but that's one of my favorites. The, the Number one, bro. And, and this is strictly not only because of it being scary, but also because of the performances mixed with the direction. Again, for everybody who knows me, I'm trying to be a director out there in real life. So I love directors, signatures and styles and all that kind of stuff, man. That's like what I, what I really am into. So for number one, I have to go with The Shining, bro. Like The Shining is a super iconic. I think it's something that we see in pop culture references today. Even mm-hmm. when you're playing, uh, even when you're playing on uh, Mortal Kombat and here's Johnny, like people know about that. They think it's from that, but no, it's from The Shining. Shining came out in 1980, directed by Stanley Kubrick, who's one of them. $19 million budget made $47 million, and it's basically about after landing a job as an off-season caretaker, Jack Torrance, who's played by um, Jack Nicholson, is an aspiring author and a recovering alcoholic who drags his wife, Wendy, and gifted son, Danny, to the snow-covered Colorado secluded Overlook Hotel. However, he's going through writer's block, and it prevents Jack from pursuing a new writing career. Everything has its time, however, because basically the first manager must give Jack a grand tour. And then after that, the facility's aging chef chats with their son, Danny, about the rare psychic gift that Danny actually has. So Danny, like, appears to talk to his imaginary friend, but it's actually a gift. Like, And the mysterious employee also warns the boy about the, the hotel's abandoned rooms. It says never, never go into room 237, especially. It's off limits. And that's basically what he does. And Jack starts gradually losing his mind. After all that, there's a lot of strange occurrences and blood chilling visions that have the family trapped in a silent, a big prison hammered by endless snowstorms. And it's very insistent voices that go through Jack's head that lead him to demand a sacrifice, meaning that he's going to murder his 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 family. And it's yeah. crazy. It was adapted from a Stephen King book who, ironically enough, he disowned the film as soon as it came out, um, which was, was kind of weird. Um, Kubrick is so intentional as a director that people constantly pick at the, the, the movie apart with Easter eggs and fan theory. So I think yeah. that was like one of those movies that were, were new for that, where it's like, yo, what do those two girls mean at the end of the hall? Which is a vision we always see. Or what do these, what does 237 mean? Or what is like, there's always, and again, this is before like the internet. So people are to this day still dissecting like what the true meaning of certain symbolisms in this movie were. And I think he implements so many amazing filmmaking techniques that get you, you know, that's things that you can learn from. Again, I'm trying to learn when it comes to creating a film and these are the type of shots and, and camera angles and things, sequences that he created that are being taught in film school because of how innovative and in, in this ingenuity and this genius that it was. And one of the coldest cold openings ever is the credits in the opening of the movie where it's a long tracking shot done by a helicopter overview of Denver mixed with the great score. It's like super legendary. And that score has been redone, remixed, has been prevalent in hip hop. If you hear that beat drop, you will know what that score is. Um, the overall use of the study cam, I think throughout the movie is something that I couldn't take my eyes off of. I mean, the film itself following the ax hitting the door, uh, the guy who invented the study cam, Gar- Garrick Brown, actually worked on this movie. So that's why there's so many uses of the study cam. And that's why it was done so well. And the study cam actually feels like a character. Like I always talk about having that secondary aspect, not just the actual people in the movie, but like who else can embody uh, a personality throughout the film. And for me, it was a study cam because when Danny is like riding the big wheel throughout the hotel over the carpet and then through the hardwood floors and sound changes, it just adds another level of eeriness. And honestly, it's like sensationally dark. It's like it's, it's just like great directorial work by Kubrick. And then the study cam also feels like a perspective of the ghost or the haunting or the shining for that matter. And the colors, the imagery, like when the blood comes rushing from the hallways, it's like scary as hell. I'm just like, bro, what? Like, how did you make this? It's incredible. But how did you make this? Why? And the two little twins saying like, Danny, come play with, come play with us forever and i'm just like yo like it's just it was it was w things and the, the, thing snow, w, the whole, whole thing and the snowy hedge maze like as it like i just came from halloween haunt at wonderland and there's a whole bunch of mazes and i'm just like bro getting stuck in a maze um is crazy but the fortuitiveness of the kid danny to retrace his steps so his pops can't get him was also like iconic and then it's a film about writer's block, parenthood, alcoholism, and husbands who resent their marriage. 
And I think it has like a slow burn in terms of success because Nicholson didn't even get nominated for Best Actor despite his iconic performance. His face was crazy. His eyes were crazy. He was cooking um, with delusional energy. <laughs> I think we've seen the behind the scenes stuff. I think I've seen this to you before, maybe posted on scene DMs where he's warming up for a scene similar to how yeah, yeah, Leo yeah. He gets like locked in. Yeah. yeah and he's yeah, like, yeah. he's like, whatever you're ready, Stanley. Like he's like in character, like just talking to the, to the AD, talking to the, to the light people. And he's like getting ready with the ax. And it's like crazy. It reminds you of Leo, uh, DiCaprio when he's in the Wolf of Wall Street and he's about to get ready to shake, he his, to hand. shake his hand. Yeah. Yeah. Behind mm-hmm. the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Crazy, crazy. Like that's a definition of a man that's locked in, bro. And yeah. then, like I said, he's super menacing. Every vernacular decision he makes is memorable. Like all his quotes, especially when he's explaining to his wife, like when he's like, I won't hurt you, darling. It's like, I won't hurt you, darling. I'm just going to bash your head in. Like all that stuff just sticks with me. Then the red rum scene, like I didn't know what red rum meant until I watched this movie. It's murder spelled backwards. Mm-hmm. That scene is creepy as hell when Danny's like, red rum. Red, red. I'm like, bro, what the hell? And he's saying it over and over and over again. Then he takes his mom's lipstick, writes it on the door. And then Stanley Cooper does an amazing shot where when she wakes up and he has the, the knife in his hand plus the lipstick because of what he just wrote, she hugs him and she looks in the mirror. And that's how you can see it says murder because it's like it's her backwards. perspective through the mirror yeah. backwards. I'm like, that is just Chef's Kiss genius. Red rum, red rum, red rum, oh, red rum, red rum. I also learned too that De Niro and Robin Williams were considered for the role. And I'm happy that I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what they would have done with it, but I'm happy they didn't take it because again, Jack Jack Nicholson did his thing in it. But it would have been as a De Niro guy, it would have been cool to see that. And even as a fan of Robin Williams, I know he could go over the top for sure. And then lastly, I'll say too, like the famous act scene, it took three days to shoot and they went through 60 doors. So that's like another example of how, how crazy Stanley Kubrick was. Like apparently Shelly Duvall, the, the main, uh, the Wendy, the wife on set was going crazy and he was breaking her down. And even the guy that played the, the butler, or whatever, he went to go do another film after and he did it for, uh, Clint Eastwood. And Clint Eastwood is actually known for like being a one take type of guy. So the other, when the guy went to go do the Clint Eastwood film, he, he did like his first, you know, take. And Clint was like, all right, we got it. All right, we'll to the next location. The guy's like, what? That's it? Like, I was prepared to do it like 20 more times because he was so <laughs> conditioned. <laughs> he was so Glass conditioned Stanley, to being under yeah. Stanley Kubrick. And Stanley Kubrick tries to get every single angle because he's crazy as hell. And not to give the viewers a little insight what we're doing, but we, you know, we're getting into the filming stuff too. And it just goes to show you like just the level of detail that goes into it. Because like I said, the man, the scene is just a man hitting the door with an ax. Like, how does it take three days? <laughs> and how do you run through 60 doors? Like, like what? Wh- how would you not get that in five doors and and, and in like a couple hours? I don't yeah. know. And then how, picking the take is even is even harder. Like harder, you know, bro. sixty takes or however many takes you have to do it. So mm-hmm. uh, and I've heard stories about how he made one guy, one actor, almost fought Stanley because the, he made the actor walk through a door one hundred and twenty something different times. And yeah, I think it was it Tom Cruise. Nah, it was Tom Cruise actually, yeah, it was somebody in that movie, but Tom Cruise actually liked but it. He, but he said he said he he made it, and he was like getting upset because like, bro, like, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? And he's just yeah. like, no, just keep doing it. No, just keep doing it. He wouldn't give you no feedback. He just like keep doing it. Like, imagine a coach feedback. just like, yo, keep doing a layup. And you're just like, bro, all right, am I supposed to right yeah. foot, left foot? And he's like, no, just keep doing a layup. And I'm just like, bro, all right. And uh, the little boy Danny didn't even know it was a horror film, so they protected him. So they made him think it was a drama. He didn't even realize until years later that he was in a horror film, which I think added to his performance. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing I'll say too is, um, it was supposed to take 17 weeks to film. And just to finish the thought that me and Mikhail just talked about is instead it took 51. So it took a year. So, so the studio was like, we're going to cut this blank check for you. Make this movie. You're Stanley Kubrick. You're one of the goats. Oh, how long does it take? 17 weeks? And it ended up taking a year. So that just goes to show you that when you sign on to do a project with someone like Stanley Kubrick, who's not here with us, but it was like, that was a commitment that you had to give to him where it was like, bro, I own you for this production. Um, but again, when it comes to the imagery, uh, the, the stuff where his wife finds Jack working and he snaps on her and is like, don't ever bother me while I'm working. And then when she actually sees him wake up from that crazy dream because he's possessed, you see like all the stuff he written on the page and he just wrote one sentence and a whole book of one sentence. Mm-hmm. Is is crazy, is menacing. I thought I was a crazy device using the film. And then we just talked about, you know, Russell Crowe and a beautiful mind and the whole use of schizophrenia. But in this movie, man, they set the precedence for that. You know, he's going to Jack Nicholson's going to the bar 
And it's like he's talking to a bartender and there's other people in the room, but we realize that the hotel is actually empty. So like, again, when it comes to a filmmaking standpoint, I just thought that was one of the better movies and it scared the hell out of me, especially when you watch it with the sound up, you know, in the dark by yourself. It's pretty menacing. No, it was a great list, man. Uh, I don't agree with Shining. I don't really personally like it that much, um, but uh, it's each their own, um, personally. Um, wow, why you didn't like it? No, I just didn't think it was that good. Uh, that is, is overrated? Yeah, definitely think it's overrated. That's why I do not have it on my top 10. Um, fair, 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 fair. Um, but uh, for my fifth pick, I am going. I was actually going to go with Halloween as well. But since I'm trying to switch it up, I'm going to go with Candyman. Oh, yeah. It came out in 1992. Um, it's, it's about a girl named Helen Lyle in Chicago uh, and her friend Bernadette uh, as they researched their thesis about an urban legend of the uh, in the University of uh, Illinois, where Helen's husband, Trevor Lyle, gives classes. Helen becomes obsessed by the legend of Candyman, a son of slaves whose father became rich in 1890 after inventing a device for mass producing of shoes. The educated candy man was an artist, but when the daughter of a powerful man got pregnant of him, her father hired some men to kill him. The candy man, uh, then the candy man lived through the moniker of saying his name five times in the mirror. Um, and a lot of people in the area, uh, because they went to go do the thesis and do the research. A lot of people in that area, actually were terrified and afraid and said, like, we don't say, we don't talk about that. We don't say anything about that. But the girl was determined. Um, and they said his name five times. And then Candyman came through and started murking people. Um, and then it turned into a, 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 like a whole thing, able to eventually kill him. Um, but then the sacrificing themselves as well. Uh, it was, it was just a, it was, it was an insane movie. Um, but it lives on, um, obviously, through all of us, because as we know, we don't. Nobody still talks about Candyman. Nobody says Candyman <laughs> five times in the mirror. Nobody says any of that stuff. So, um, obviously, a classic horror film. Um, in that regard. Who is that? Helen, I came for you. Um, the next one, my fourth film, um, is from 1996, uh, Scream is the film, um, a year after her mother's death, Sydney Prescott, um, and her friends started experiencing some strange phone calls. They later learned the calls were coming from a crazed serial killer and a white face mask, as we call ghost face, uh, um and a large black robe looking for revenge his phone calls usually consist of many of many questions the main one being what's your favorite scary movie um along with much scary movie trivia ending with bloody pieces of innocent lives scattered around the small town of woodsboro um scream obviously as we know um, has lived on for many, many years with them making more and more installments over throughout the years. But the main thing is Ghostface is mask is actually one of the most famous masks, horror mask, or I mean, Halloween mask ever. Nice. Um, and anything that we know, um, it is one of the biggest, uh, possibly selling, uh, mask, but also one of the most recognizable masks, just as long as, uh, alongside, uh, Mike Myers, like, um, like Dwayne said. Um, it was a cultural classic because it was a teenage film about a serial killer. It was very grounded. It didn't have superpowers or anything like that. It was just more grounded and just serial killer based with a mask. So it was something that everybody could possibly experience. So that's why it made it more terrifying. Um, movies that are more grounded and less supernatural are the ones that kind of, hold us in, not any spirits or anything like that. Yeah. That's why in, even in The Shining was kind of confusing or whatever. But anyways, mm -hmm. but it's just like more practical in a sense. Um, and um, if you haven't seen it, uh, spoiler alert, but it ends up being her boyfriend and the boyfriend's friend. And it's two people. That's why everybody's like, yo, how's Ghostface able to be here and here and here? And why is the boyfriend able to be here? But then the other ghost is because there's multiple people that play in the Ghostface mask, which... Is there's a, a bunch of killings in that movie, 
Um, a lot of callbacks, a lot of fourth wall ish kind of breaks, uh, especially in uh, Scream 2, uh, where they talk about sequels. They say sequels are not really good movies. Sequels are never pan out. Tell me, name me a better, a sequel that's better than the original. Mm-hmm. And they kind of break that fourth wall. Um, so Scream in all that regard is a historical marvel when it comes to horror films because of what it created and also because of the mask. Who is this? You tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I don't think so. What's that noise? Popcorn. You making popcorn? Uh huh. I only eat popcorn at the movies. Well, I'm getting ready to watch a video. Really? What? Oh, just some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, I don't know. You have to have a favorite. What comes to mind? Um, third on my list is. A movie from 2013, and it's called Oculus. The first time oh, I watched yeah. this movie, I was terrified. Um, I watched it in the dark. I was by myself. Um, and by the way, before I continue, I want to let everybody know that there's obviously other movies, namely Sinister, namely Insidious, namely Paranormal Activity and all those ones. Conjuring. Um, yeah, yeah, Conjuring. Yeah, sorry, The Conjuring. Mm-hmm. But I have never seen those movies. Oh. I don't know if Dwayne has. I have <laughs> never seen those movies. And I, um, I'm not huge on horror in that sense. Um, so I haven't seen those movies. So again, I'm just talking about the favorite ones that I have seen. I, uh, eventually will get the grab, get the balls to watch those movies, but at the, the, at, the at the various, at these, at this time, um, I'm unable to, but hey, maybe Halloween next year, part two, yeah, part two I'll part two. be able to talk about a different top 10 and talk about, hey, new movies that I've seen. And, mm-hmm. um, if anybody wants to hate me for it, I'm sorry, but I don't care. Anyways, so third on my list, like I said, Oculus came out in 2013. It was about a young boy, essentially, that killed his parents and went to jail for it for a very long time. Went to a mental institute, actually, on top of it. Um, his sister believed that this mirror in their house from back in the day was the mirror that was the thing that killed their parents. Um or caused their brother to kill the parents. The brother was just like, yo, let's let it go. We shouldn't be doing this, whatever, whatever, whatever. And she's like, no, like, we got to test it out. We got to prove it. Like, I want to prove everything. Like, da 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 da. The brother's like, all right, bro, but like, I just got out. Like, you know what I mean? I'm trying to be blessed. Like, just da- la- allow me, allow me, allow me. And she's like, nah. So they set up a whole rig, bring the mirror back to their old house and try to set up a rig to actually break the mirror. But for some reason, they are unable to. Every single thing they try to do, is they're unable to. And while staying in the house, they are dragged into a lot of flashbacks where the father is acting erratic, mother's acting erratic, and everybody's just going crazy because the mirror has spirits involved. Um, and the movie just is just a roller coaster of emotions of you never know what's going on, what's real, what's fake, what's because like everything is just like. Uh, it's like so quick, so fast, even to the point where like if the closer you are to the mirror, the more likely that you're going to experience hallucina- hallucinations. So at one point, um, one of the characters, the sister character played by Karen Gillian, um, she actually tries to bite into an apple and realizes after the crunch that she literally just bit it into a glass, a, a, a glass cup, um, a glass. So, so she, then was like, like in awe, she cut up her entire mouth, bite into the glass. She's just like, yo, like, what the hell? Like, whatever, whatever, whatever. But it's just proving her point more and more that the mirror had something to do with the passing of her parents. Uh, finally, with the movie ending, which was insane, the movie ending with, uh, the son finally having an open view of murking the mirror has this uh anvil coming down to break the mirror sharp object going straight into the mirror to break it he pressed the button as soon as he pressed the button his sister appears and he kills her because he didn't know that she was in front of the mirror um because the mirror tricked him into killing his sister and when he's leaving he sees everybody in his family in the in the window saying bye to him as he goes to jail again um, as his parents stand there and his sister stand there, making it a creepy ending to a creepy ass movie. Um, so that was Oculus. I hope this still hurts. And 
at coming in at number three. Number two has to be the 1998 remake of the, I mean, sorry, not 1998. The remake, uh, the, the original is from 1998, which is called Ringu. But the, the remake came out in 2002 called The Ring. Play, uh, starring Naomi Watts. Um, and it, and essentially it's about Rachel Keller, who is a journalist investigating a videotape that may have killed four teenagers, including her niece. There is an urban legend about this tape. The viewer will die seven days after watching it. If the legend is correct, Rachel will have to run against time, a uh, uh, race against time to save her sons and her own life. The movie is insane. Um, I don't know how else to say it, but the movie is one of the scariest movies I saw as a child. Um, bringing me to never even want to watch TV. Uh, for a very long time, not watch videotapes, but I watch one, I watch movies, TV shows, any of that kind of things. Um, because of what possibly, possibly might come out of the TV. Um, man, I, I, it's just a classic in that sense, but I just remember the fear it struck into my heart and into the, and to everybody around me. Um, with the long black hair, the girl coming out of the well, it was just, um, insane. Um, I don't know how else to say it. Um, do you have any comments on that one? Cause I know that one was insane. Um, I know I haven't asked any comments, but this one was actually very terrifying. So the hair thing for me was something that like to this day, I think is pretty. The hair thing is on, on, on became on one of the most, like, was one of the most, yeah, one of the most iconic. If I'm asking about like a shower and I see hair in the shower, Bro, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm telling you, it, was one, it became one of the most, it, came, it literally became one of the most iconic ways to scare people. Mm -hmm. Um, with just holding your hair. I remember when I was in uh, elementary school, we had a haunted house makeshift and there was one girl that just had long hair and all she did to scare everybody was just put the hair over her head and just like hair, walk like that. Yeah. And everybody's terrifying. Yeah, I'm over here. Terrifying, bro. Terrifying. 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 Um, but the last one, our number one on my list, and again, people may say whatever they want, but at the time that I watched the film, I was living in this place called Creedmoor, North Carolina. If anybody knows where Creedmoor, North Carolina is, is in the middle of North Carolina, in the middle of nowhere. A lot of farmland, a lot of open areas. Um, and when I watched this movie, came out in 2001. It made me feel I was on a one. It was on a, a two lane road where one going one way, one going the other. And it made me feel like I was close or even possibly in that same area. And this movie is called Jeepers Creepers. Uh, and the synopsis of the film is on their way back home during the spring break. Derry, Derry and Patricia Jenner uh, witness a mysterious person dumping something down our tunnel. Why you would pay attention, why you would care. I have no idea. I mind my business. Um, deciding to discover what was dumped down there. Again, mind my business. And yes, they were. Um, Derry discovers a huge disturbing hideout full of more, uh, mod uh, modified bodies. Derry and Patricia set off to get help, unaware that the individual is now aware of who has been down the tunnel. Derry and Patricia soon realize that their pursuer is not just a mysterious person, but something even more horrifying who has more in store than they could possibly imagine. This man chases them down, tries to turn them off the road. They're able to get away. They think they get away. And this man is a creature of the underworld, has wings, snatches people up. Once he snatches you up, there's nothing anybody else can do to save you. And that's what happens. And jeepers, creepers, <laughs> where did you get them peepers? Yeah, you know what I mean? That thing right there is enough to make a grown man cry. So that is my last one, our number one pick of uh, the top 10. I think we all we both picked very good ones, and I think that um, maybe next time we might have some more. So we'll see. But um, definitely, this is definitely. 
this is the end of Act 2. Quick media time. We'll be back for a quick Act 3 and uh, the wrap-up. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Act 3, uh, Scene DM Season 3, Issue 50, The Big Five O. Alrighty, so now we're on to Act 3. We talked about our top 10s. And since we obviously just talked about our top 10s, had that list, um, I want a quick, quick, like, spitfire. You know why? Because I don't want you to think about it. I don't want you to think. Quick thought process, because I'm going to try to do it as quickly as possible, too. Of which movie, top 10, do you think you can survive? With 10 being the most likely you can survive. Oh, second, sorry. One being the most likely you can survive. And, and 10 being absolutely not, I cannot survive it at all. So we're going to go the opposite way. Then we're going to go one to 10. So where do you start off with? So one is I can survive or can't? Sorry. Uh, what do you think is better? I don't know. How, I don't know. How it's better <laughs> way to do it. I said I one, know. you, I guess one, you can't survive. 10, you can. 10, you can survive. One, you can't survive. So, 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 go from one. so go for, so then go from 10 then. It's the most okay. one that you can survive. Yes. Most survival for me. sure has to be, I think, a poltergeist. Cause again, if, if the house is acting up, I'm, I'm moving. Like, like cause the demon is not, is not attached to anybody in particular. It's, attached it's, to the it's, it's attached to the house. Yeah. So but is, it, like, is the girl not, so, so say it was your little sister. She's in the TV. You're not going to bless. Is it try to save her? Well, that's different. Yeah, see, that, that's see, like, nah, uh, see you're not surviving. Thank you. <laughs> see, I'm debunking them already. This is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> but it took a while for the girl to get lost in the TV. Like they had many red flags. As okay, talk okay, about. fair enough. Yeah. fair enough. Fair enough. They fair ignored enough. the red flags. Like that. Okay, what do we say enough. in Jamaica, bro? Uh, if those who don't hear must feel. So. Must feel. They must. They must. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's number nine? Number nine, I think, would be Halloween because. Yeah, I don't know much like that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. step out of here. <laughs> so, but yeah, and they want to walk. walk. All right, you gonna see? Yeah. You gonna see? And, and that's what they do. Michael Byers has never ran after anybody, fam. He Not just one walks. single sprint. So I'm, I'm I never understand. Say, but, but you see those, you see those uh, memes of the uh, when they're making fun of him. They're saying how the man is. The man Loki, when they say that they take the camera off, that's sprinting. Yeah. sprinting. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> no, nah, it's in those. Okay, so number nine is Halloween. What about number eight? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Exorcist again, bro. Unless, it, it, I don't want to sound crazy, bro. If it's my cousin, if my daughter, if my kid, I'm not going to lie. I don't have to, yeah. We wow. That's send insane. Board, I send you to boarding school. because This man said that. boarding school. Like, that's going to do anything. That's insane. So what are you going to do? Oh. Pack their bags for them. Pack the bags for them. Send you see how she's trying to head 360 and do, uh, j- yeah. jumping off of the bed? How are you going to even get out of the house? I'm calling child services and I'm leaving. I'm, I have yes, no... Said, I'm calling child services. Bro, the demon took over my youth, bro. What do you want me to do? It's, that's it's insane, child. bro. That's insane. <laughs> I'm going to say that's insane right now. Uh, what's, what's number seven, then? Um, I guess the Texas... No, that one's tough. Nigga said Texas. Oh, oh, oh um, I'm, I'm Halloween four. Halloween four. Um, because it's from my okay, right? again. Yeah, yeah Halloween four yeah, again. Yeah. Michael, yeah, you have to catch me, gang. And you older too? Yeah, I know his knees hurt. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, I know your knees are on fire. <laughs> but again, one, 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 <laughs> he, he one step away from an ACL tear for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, bro. I know I you, don't, you. you don't be stretching, so it's all right, bro. Don't worry about it. Uh, nah. What's number? Uh, what's number six? I ain't gonna lie. The, it is not, bro. I was never a curious kid, bro. My ball gets stuck or gets. All right. I'll be like, yeah, yeah. Like, come down here and get it. Uh, you yeah. know what? Actually, uh, I'm, I'm gonna get another one. I'd I rather get beatings at home for losing it than I know, whatever you. that's going on over there. Uh, Mom so. with the ball. I lost it. I lost it. Double, lost double it up your hands. Come hey, on. I'll get the belt for you. Don't worry about it. I got the belt right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. I'll get the belt for you. Here you go. What me, but I'm not about to stick my arm in there so I can get chopped off. You crazy. Absolutely not. Uh, what's the number one? Man in a sewer. <laughs> that's <laughs> the number one thing. I'm not, I was, not, I was, uh, hey, bro. Hey, we, we were, we were maybe not the, the brightest of the bright kids. <laughs> but I was smart enough to know why in God's name would I go into a sewer? Are you insane? Why is a man in a sewer? Yeah, absolutely not. Anyways, uh, what's the, what's number five? Number five, I would say hereditary, but that one was tough. Like, because you don't know it's coming, I guess. It's internal. 
Yeah, because it's hereditary. Literally. It's hereditary, but there are some signs. Like Tony Collette's character started acting crazy. Mom, if you start bugging out like that, again, <laughs> I'm gonna go stay with dad. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm gonna stay with dad. Still figure it out. Was, when when you figure it out, call me back. Still, <laughs> my mom was begging us to have a family seance. Like I'm out of here. Like, wow, who are you? What are you talking about? Like, no, you're you're bugging. No, nah, easily. Um, What's number four? Uh, number four, I probably have to go with. I guess. I guess I'll go with uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. That one's tough yeah. again, but shoot, I guess I ain't going to sleep because I'm doing everything I can to stay uh, Bro, <laughs> did you say uh, Nightmare on Elm Street is number four? Yeah, I know. Bro, I can't sleep. That should be number one still. It should it's still. I'm not going to say, but that's your list, but I'm just saying that should be number what? one because what did you just, say? No, there's no way you can sleep, bro. What did you say? How do, I'm still up. I'm going to be up, bro. What are you talking about? Nigga going to be taking everything known to man to stay up. <laughs> everything known to man. I'm going to be wide awake. <laughs> Take my eyelids open. You're crazy. Or I'm just not going to dream. I'm going to be heavy sedated. So when I sleep, I'm not dreaming. I'm just heavy sedated. Um, what am I at? Three or two? Uh, you're at, uh, that was four. So you have three more. You have three right now. Damn. Uh, three? I, um, at three, I will go with, 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 I guess the, yeah, the shining, bro. The shining. I think the shining because my spouse acts crazy and tries to kill me. Like it's up, bro. John Wick. Sorry, because the only thing about the shining that was made it difficult is that there was a storm, so like you like it was hard to leave type of thing. Yeah. And you're by yourself and you're isolated. Yeah. But again, bro, I, like I had to defend myself, bro. Uh, I'm about to set up some home alone traps in the, in the hotel, and that's that. What's that home alone traps? What's next? Uh, number two would probably be Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Again, that one, that one's tough to get away from because, yeah, if I'm deserted, no phone lines, can't reach for help. But again, there was a lot of avoidable signs and, and red flags in that. I'm not picking up a hitchhiker. Uh, I'm not stopping at a gas station with only one fuel. Yeah. Uh, and, but yeah, if I, if I, and then there, bro, if, if, if my boy Makai went missing and I saw like his, varsity jacket or hoodie on the house, like on the banister of a house I don't know, and it's unlocked. I'm not, I'm just, that's, personally me, I'm not going to get it. Like, mm-hmm, I'm, exactly. I'm going to scream your name a couple of times. Yo, Merv! Merv! He's trying to FaceTime me a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. Just text, I'm not gonna, like, yo, you're blessed? All right, say less. <laughs> say less. Yo, give me a year if you're blessed, bro. But I'm not going to walk into a house people I don't know, especially in the South. They have the stand, stand your ground law. I'm not going to get off the porch ASAP. So, uh, and then I guess what that leaves me with, oh, the Blair Witch Project. That one, I think, is that my number one? Yeah, one more. yeah. Blair Witch Project, I, I'm probably cooked though, because that one was scary. So, because, bro, you, I don't know if you've ever been to like, well, you, have to, you, have to, you have to live in, 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 in it through the POV too, like just like bro, that too. What? And, and again, I played in Vancouver this past summer. So it's like dealing with hiking. I'm not good with landmarks. And that frightening scene at the end where she's like, it's the same log. It's the same. And they realize they've been going in circles. And bro, I would be cooked. So I'm not going to lie. I would say, which take me? Like, I would just, eh. bro, I wake up from the tent and I see a stone mountain being built outside my tent and none of my mans did it. Yeah, it's cooked. So I'm not going to lie to you. And I'm only looking through the POV of a camera. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. See, and the lighting wasn't that good back then. You should have no been LED. out there. You should have been, been out there. You're right. You're right. That's number one. Right. That's why you should have, this should have never been on facts. facts. Yeah. That one is the scariest. You're walking in circles, you see the same thing over and over again, bro. I'll go crazy, bro. Oh, no. Yo, if I, as long as I have a gun, I'm going to shoot myself, huh? It's <laughs> um, Yo, but uh, my list, um, I would have to go number 10 uh, easily. Um, Candyman. I'm not saying the nigga's oh, name okay. five times, so that's obvious. I'm not saying his name five times, so. What that's you say, just three times? No, I don't say. I don't even say Bloody Mary because that one was also scary. Oh, one too. yo, that was in school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that one too, huh? Um, I remember all the mirror ones. Um, <laughs> says uh, number nine would have to be Gremlins. That's easy. I wouldn't even get a furry pet, and if I did, I would listen to the rules. I'm not an idiot. Um, personally, you didn't um, have a you didn't have a chia pet growing up. No, I didn't have a chia pet. I didn't either. I was just asking. Just making sure. Just see what I never had one of those. Remember those ones you had to take care of on those like little devices? I never had one of those either. 
You remember oh, what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking you about. You had to yeah, feed yeah. it and all that, look at you and all that yeah, stuff. And, yeah, yeah. and he came back and it was dead because he didn't feed it. Oh, yes. I couldn't even um, eat my goldfish. So. Oh, there, there we go. Um, <laughs> I would say, uh, yeah, number eight would have to be Halloween. Oh, sorry, sorry. I don't have Halloween on my list. I'm sorry. Uh, that's. I apologize, everybody. I was looking at my list. Um, ooh. I'd have to say The Grudge. Yeah. Uh, number eight. Because I then wouldn't just travel somewhere to just figure out what's going on in that house or going on what with, 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 with this, this this entity is. So that's yeah. number eight for me. And granted, if I had to follow the rules of everything going on, then I would just probably kill myself myself so that I don't have to do it. I'm just, <laughs> hey, I, you know, I'm, just I, I'm just talking from the perspective of being in these movies. And that's okay. respectful, okay? All right? I'm not talking about uh, right now. I'm just talking about the podcast. All right. No, not at all, bro. Um, next, I would have to go. Damn, bro. Well, the ring. I'm not gonna watch a video that I know kills people. So that's number seven. I'm gonna have to go number seven with the ring. Uh, are you sure? Yes, remember high school, I remember, remember well, what? Uh, remember what? Two oh, girls. Oh, oh, don't, say, don't say. Don't say. Don't say. Yeah. yeah two girls. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. 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 <laughs> I must say, really? Let me take a look at it. No, 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 no. But if I, know, if I know specifically, like they knew in the movie, that it kills people, that supposedly it kills people, why in God's name okay. would I watch it? Yeah, okay, there, that's why. That's why. That's okay, different. Sure, sure. That's different. Sure. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that's number seven. Um, number six. Damn, this one's... This, this, my list, I feel like, is a little harder than yours, to be honest. It, with is, it is. It is. Um, number six. God. Oculus, you're cooked. <laughs> Oculus, I'm cooked, bro. Saw cooked. Jeepers Scoopers cooked. Like, I'm, Hills of Eyes cooked, bro. Everything, I'm cooked. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm cooked. So, uh, I'm going to go with six. I'm, I'm going to have to just go with Scream. Scream seems like the lesser of all evils right now. Yeah, you can get uh, out of right. Ghostface, I can outrun that nigga. I mean, yeah. I can run out two of them niggas. Uh, that'll be all right. Man, um, I called my phone twice. Yeah, I'm yeah, man, out. I called my phone twice. The shoddy is coming out the crib. <laughs> bro, don't even worry about it, man. Don't even worry about it. So, I mean, nobody's coming true to the, the house at that point. So, right. when I was talking crazy to me on my phone, I told you it's gonna be like that the, the Drake song where it's like, you have reached the like, I'm yeah, all you can my life. Bro, the man's gonna say, what, What's your favorite scary movie? Hang up. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be, as soon as he says, What is block? Block. Block. Call me down. Block. No. So, anyway, that's number six. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, God, man, this is d- difficult. Um, but lesser of all evils in this one, I guess, it would have to be no get out number five. I don't know if it's a baddie. As she said, come meet the family. <laughs> well, I've already met Tay's family, and that didn't happen. So, I <laughs> this guy's uh, wild. <laughs> um, but maybe they're prepping me. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, guessing. Guessing, but, um, but yeah, I'll probably be able to figure that one out pretty simply. Like, I, I you know, what I mean, I think I would. I think, you know, what I mean, I think, but well, maybe you like tea, huh? I know yeah. you like tea, so as soon as she offers you tea, you're cooked. Oh, who made it? Sunken so, place. Yeah, like, oh, easy, 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 easy. The tea will get me. 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 Peppermint tea still? Yeah, peppermint tea will get me still. I'm not going to lie. Before bed? Yeah, it'll get me still. I'm not going to lie. That would that, that would get me cooked. So I'm gonna, like, I'll cook me still. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so that's number five. Number four. Damn. Uh, number four would have to be. Hills, bro. You don't have to. You don't have to listen to the guys. Hills that rides. Yeah. yeah. At first, I would have my car either filled up, and if I did, and the man said a shortcut, I'd be like, "Thanks, bro." No, I'm That's listening to ways. The same. I'm listening to ways. Ways always. Ways always. But actually, I want to listen to ways still because ways might take me that way because they they always right. look for a shortcut. That's ways. Uh, if I don't want to get anywhere on time. Uh, just look at Google Maps. Google Maps or or, or, or Apple Maps. Or, or just put take take a um avoid tolls. You're good. You're blessed. No four seven. Or you're taking the long way for sure. Bro, yeah. If you put avoid tolls for sure, I'm going down that road, huh? I'm no. going through the hills, not not around them. I'm going through the hills. That's like, that ways. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'll, I guess I'll go for number four. I'll go hills of eyes. Um, still insane though. Um, insane. number three. <sighs> <sighs> Number three, uh, I guess uh, Saw. 
I guess saw man that that I'm not gonna survive. So saw is, yeah. saw is cooked. None of these last three ones I'm gonna survive. So saw I'm cooked. Cooked. Right. Um, number two, Jeepers Creepers. I wouldn't be cooked only because I wouldn't go to the man's house and check the body. But I think he looks for people anyway. I don't think it it, it matters. I, Jeepers Creepers two. The man just killed a bunch of kids because they're on a school bus driving by. It mm-hmm. wasn't really anything. There was no rhyme or reason to it. So, I, I personally, yeah, you're cooked. And he can fly. Yeah. And he can oh, pick wow. up like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and he has, it's, yeah, you're cooked. 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 Um, and he has like sharp, bro, sharp <laughs> weapons. Like sharp. Like, man, two, one of the things in Jeepers Super is two into a, into a bus tire, fam. You know how sharp something has to be to go through a bus tire? Cheers. Cheers. Uh, anyways, and flattened it immediately. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Dead. Jeeper Scoop is done. Um, uh, and then, yeah, the last one would be Oculus. So, my top 10 of, of surviving Oculus, I'll be dead. So, even though I wouldn't go through the whole mirror thing and I wouldn't go into the house, if I had to, yeah, I'd be dead. Yeah. Um, dead immediately. So, that's the top. And, um, so to finish out the act, man, as Hoopers, bro. We yeah. always, always try to compare everything into to hooping, most things. So today we're gonna compare. We're gonna make a. Uh, we're gonna compare, but then also make a starting five. Actually, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna do both. We're gonna do both. Tough. Okay. So we're gonna make a starting five, and then we're gonna compare each of those starting five players to an NBA player. So Dwayne, your starting five horror movie characters. Who you got? All right, so number one, I got Michael Myers for sure. At your one spot? At your one spot? He's running the offense? Signature kill. But guess what? It's Braun at the one. My point four. Braun at the one. Point four. So you have a Mike Myers at the one? At the one, fam. He's he's the one running the show? I don't know if if his strategy is up to it. No no fast breaks for sure. He only wants to kill one person. So I don't know. I don't know, but we'll get it. He's just focused. That means if I say run this play, he's running this one play only. So he's compared to who? Who's Mike Myers? I'm saying he's Braun because he's stood the test of time. He's the longevity is there for me. These are still good. He's, these are still good. He has, you know how Braun has a signature look at the ball, step back. Uh, his his signature uh, kill is sticking a knife or something into somebody and leaving them up there on the door frame for for yeah, everyone to see. You know how strong he is. Oh my gosh! Yeah, 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 yeah. that's insane <laughs> for sure. Um, I guess at my two, I know you hate this guy. But I'm putting him on my list. I, at my two, I'm going to go with uh, uh, Jason Voorhees. And for him, I'm going to go with Steph Curry. You're saying the man is 30? 30 There's clip. no way. 30 clip. Wow. That's a, that's actually, wow. That's insane. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Interesting. For my three, for my three, I think I want to go with, I think I'm going to go with Pennywise at, at the three spot. And for him, I'm going to go with KD. Because I want to, I want someone that's, like when they say Pennywise can shape shift, I want someone that's able to adapt to every style of offense in basketball. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, yo, you know, he, he, adapt. He, he, yo, can, he can play the fast, but he can, he can do pick and roll. He can set the screen. He can post up. Uh, he can, he can <laughs> dunk on man. He can ball handle. He's just very adaptive. His skill set is adaptive. He's able to shape shift, literally. So, <laughs> Durantula, uh, aka Pennywise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this guy's insane. Uh, for my four, um, I want to, I want to, I want a, a big dog down there at the four spot. Uh, I think for my four, I'm gonna go. You know what? For my four, I'm gonna go with Freddy Krueger. Simply, simply because I'm all the goats. Holy, yeah, yeah. of course, goats on me. And my four is gonna be. Um, because Freddy Krueger, I feel like, is a close, close range killer. Um, doesn't really kill you from far. He needs to be close up with the long nails. And for him, I'm going to go, I could have went with Kawhi, but man's not available. So, something else. I'm going to go at Giannis at my four spot with, uh, Freddy Krueger. Just the long arms, the long wingspan. Need that. Fair, need fair that. enough. Fair enough. No, close kills only. Trade baskets. We only need Giannis shooting no trade balls. Just, this is, this is stay a good in point. the paint. Not like an all star team, but okay, cool. <laughs> And then for my, oh, you're going to hate this. Uh, for my five, I'm going to go with Jokic. And I'm, I'm, his equivalent is, is definitely going to be Leatherface. And, and why is it going to be Leatherface? Because I need a big, burly, like, you know what I'm saying? He has the IQ, but doesn't, you know what I'm saying? Like, he has the power tool. He uses his chainsaw and, and he has the vision, bro. You know what I'm saying? He, he, Leatherface, 
knows the cadavers he's going to use. He knows what type of food he's going to make out of the people. He sees the plays before it happens. He's like, oh, look at that. Look at this girl running into my house. She will make a nice dinner plate. She, you know what I'm saying? Look That's at this insane. guy coming to the house. He That's will make insane. a nice a nice wool sweater. And so I think that I'm going to use Jokic because Jokic will always see a couple plays ahead. And he's also a big, burly guy. Like I said, heavy set, heavy foot. Um, you're going to hear him coming. He's, he's not paused. He's not a uh, finesse. Hey, All yo. power. All power. All righty, man. Um, <laughs> how about you? <laughs> how about you? Uh... All right. Well, so for my five spot, I'm going to go with Slenderman. Oh, tall, athletic, Munu, Munu um, <laughs> faceless man. He's not even in it for himself. He's in it for the game. Okay. Um, team player, real team player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He real team player. Um, he just strikes terror and unease into the opposing offense or defense. Sorry, and um. He has the length. Pause. Holy pause. He has a, he has, he has, he has the wingspan to hold down the middle. I mean, mm-hmm. um, he can manipulate kids. Um, that doesn't really help us in this scenario. <laughs> it really doesn't help us in this scenario, but, uh, hopefully he can get the fans on his side because of his, uh, <laughs> it doesn't really help us in this scenario. Um, not even a little bit. Um, but <laughs> what did that guy do a hooping, bro? I'm hoping that it will help his social media gathering because then he can be like a Kai Sinet. He can be like those guys and get the followers on his side. So then he's mm-hmm. going to be, become a big market guy on the team, but personally. Perfect. On the court, he'll take care of himself. But I feel like off the court, that presence is what he, we need. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're going to be jumping around here. Um, so that was a five spot, obviously. Uh, who's who's the compared for the four there? spot? We're gonna go with a Larry Johnson, okay. Larry Johnson high flyer, uh, kind of do it all. Um, actually, I might give him Charles Barkley to be more even more okay. respectful. Okay, Charles Barkley, and we're gonna go with Jeepers Creepers here. Okay, he can fly, does the dirty work. True. Um, once he gets his claws on somebody, he, you can't you can't get him off. Facts. So you know he's gonna be in the paint. Getting rebounds, rebounds uh, finishing through the lane, bro. He's I, I don't know what to tell you, bro. With the with Slender Man in the back, he doesn't have to worry about anything. <laughs> Wait, who you, you didn't say who Slender Man was? Slender Man. Oh, sorry, sorry, Victor Wimbayami, obviously. Oh, obviously, yeah, obviously, yeah, sure. yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, we're good. good. All right, cool. Uh, for the three spot, I'm gonna go with. Because you already picked all these great players. I'm going with old time and new time players. I'm going to mm. go with Ghostface Killer. Ooh. Ghostface at the three spot because he can be at two places at once. And I'm going to give him that Scotty <laughs> oh, Pippen. Tough. That Scotty Pippen. That Scotty Pippen on both yes. ends of the court. On both ends of the court. Yeah. Both ends of the court being able to, people are like, yo, how is he able to be everywhere at once? Energy guy. Bro, he's locked in and doing his job. That's what he's there for. <laughs> Ghostface Killer, bro. All right. Tough. So that's my three spot. That's a big time. Yeah, yeah. You weren't thinking, huh? Number no, two that, spot. So. Number two spot now. <sighs> two spots can be a little difficult. All right? Two spots definitely going to be a little difficult. Very difficult. But I think, I think I'm going to have to go with the thing on this one. All right? Okay. Okay. Shape shifter, but gets the job done. And I'm going to compare that to the Black Mamba. Ooh, bean. Shape shifting into different characters. From, went from 8 to 24. Went from Kobe to Black Mamba. Bro, he's shape shifting into the character he needs to be to get the win. And if you're not following, he's going to murk you. That's what the thing does. If you don't want to follow the clan, you're done. So you can't even make it onto the squad. Yeah. He sets so, trends. Yeah. He sets trends. You see what I'm saying? He doesn't follow them. Yeah, I respect he that. He doesn't follow them. Yes, he may change into somebody else, but he's locked in on the goal. The goal is always to infiltrate and murder. Come on, bro. I can preach. Nah, yeah, that's tough. So, that's tough. All right. I'm at one spot, bro. I'm at one spot. It's going to be a little difficult. So I don't know. Um, <laughs> but doesn't really have powers. So that's going to be a problem. But damn, does he have a, 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 a thinking brain on him? I'm going to go with Jigsaw from Saw. Ooh. 
Mastermind, he yeah. is a mastermind when it comes to running the plays. He knows everything before it happens, while it happens. He has manipulations between. He has the fake outs. He has the fake DHOs into the screening <laughs> downs, into the to the to the backdoor cuts, bro. He's locked in on all the plays. You no, think I we're know. going through right here for this elevator? No, idiot. Misdirection. It's a flare screen <laughs> on the other side. Misdirection. It's not even a flare screen. It's a back door on the other side. There's only five men in the credit. It's a back door on the other side. You're oh, you're going through that. You're following through to for with our shooter. Yeah, idiot. Back door done. <laughs> Co- cooked. Cooked. <laughs> All right. So that's that's Jigsaw running the plays. He doesn't get points. It's not even about him. It's not about him. It's about his teammates. And his comparison would have to give Chris Paul mm. mastermind on the court. Even a J kid. I would even give him a J kid where he's just looking for assists. Yeah. But, but Chris Paul is a little more meaner and like a little more snake. So I would give him, I would give it to Jigsaw still. So that's my starting five. And that's your starting five. And we'll just have to see who goes yeah, yeah, yeah. to the votes, man. I mean, let's Facts. see who picks who up. But, uh, but nah, man, that is the end of episode. I mean, issue 50, man. This is a big time issue. Thank you so much for everybody tuning in. Um, and been following us. If you're if you're new, thank you for joining in. If you're not, and you've been a loyal follower from the beginning, man, thank you for 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 continued continued support. Um, it, it does not go unnoticed. And once we're big time, which you know what I mean, we're working our way to. Everybody mm-hmm. that was here from the beginning is gonna get that kind of love. Don't worry, yes. we're we know the loyal ones. Yeah. But anyways, sure that. yeah. But anyways, Dwayne has some heat check questions. He's gonna ask me. I'm gonna. <laughs> Um, so I, um, it's the part of the second the part where we do heat check. So we're going to see, we also did just talk about basketball. So this is a great time to, to discuss this part. So, all right. <clears throat> Who is, or what is this creature or thing? We had to mention it or them yeah. yet, but they are a serial killer. That does most of their work in water. Do you know who? In water? That, yeah, in water. All their kills are mainly in water. Occasionally they might hop onto a boat, but for the most part, everything is in water. In water, huh? Mm-hmm. And they're a serial killer. A serial killer, but they do it in water. Yeah. So yeah, bro, you lost me. Who is it? Jaws. So, so Jaws, who? No, the shark, Jaws. Nigga, get the hell out of here. That's you. That's you considering. That's that's that, bro. Uh, all right, bro. Oh uh, yeah, all right, bro. Next, go next question. <laughs> all right, go. Over one, bro. All right. What is the name of the uh, recent sequel that has just came out that has to deal with the facial expression? What Scream Seven or something? Oh, smile too, smile too, smile too, smile too. Uh, wow. smile too. Uh, <laughs> before you answer, I remember what it was. Thank you. The, this guy got the quiet bounce. Of the, do, do, yeah, do, damn do, right. Do, 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 do. One for two. Thank you. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, I only said ghost face because he does have an expression on his face, but whatever. And he can continue. That is true. What is a horror franchise that Donald Trump damn near insinuated and started last a couple of years ago? The Purge. Then, ah, oh, there we go. Stuff. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! That was gonna be on my top ten list. That's my honorable mention. I have a bunch no, of honorable mention, but still. A fire movie, fire movie. What are one of the tactics that a priest uses when performing an exorcist? One of the holy water, uh, the cross, and they throw the holy water on them. Yes, sir. What's that? Three, four, three, four, three, four. Yeah. All right. All right. That's the job. So that's one. Insane that I so got she's all right, two of these golden killers that we have mentioned a piece have faced off in their own movie. Who are they? Uh, Freddy vs. Jason. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I know a little bit about horror, fam. There you go. There you go. Eighty percent. You know what I mean? That's yeah. not too bad. That should Not's be bad. should be five for five. But nigga, want to use Jaws, but whatever. <laughs> um, but appreciate you, bro. Great questions. Great questions. Um, uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. Great episode. Appreciate you, brother. Um, longer episode, but hey, man, it has to be the 50th episode. Special, special edition. You special, feel me? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but now this is a segment we put, let me put you on segment of the show. 
um, where we recommend some movies, possibly TV shows, um, usually, usually connected to the topic at hand. So, <clears throat> as always, Mikhail goes first, um, as always. And for, I'm going to pick a movie, a lighthearted movie-ish, and then I'm going to pick a scary movie. So, the lighthearted movie is going to be Halloween Town, classic Disney movie. Every single time I think about Halloween, I think about Halloween Town because that movie is classic. And it's a lighthearted family, family movie. It's not scary. Can be a little scary for kids. Um, but yeah, cute movie. Like it. Halloween Town. Check it out. <clears throat> and my second one, I would suggest, um, out of the movies I have mentioned, Oculus. Yeah, I'd have to say Oculus, man. Oculus is the movie I already talked about. Actually, I already ruined it. How about <clears throat> The Purge? No, okay. Which one? Everybody, everybody's seen that. No, I take that back too. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's go with The Hills of Eyes. Creepy ass right. movie. Uh, scary movie. Maybe a little more dark for most people, but, uh, real, real scary movie. Real, real, real scary movie. Um, those are my two picks. So Halloween Town and The Hills of Eyes. What about you doing? Big time. Uh, for the less scary movie, I'm probably going to go with Twitches. I was going to go ah, Hocus Classic, classic, classic. I was going to go Hocus Pocus, but I'm going to keep it within the family and I'm going to go with Twitches. Shout out to Tia and Tamara Mari. Um, classic movie. And then for a scary movie, I'm probably going to go with Insidious, man. Insidious was frightening as hell. Um, going to use it on part two eventually, but. Yeah, City is one of those movies that are scary. As as yeah, I don't even want to think about it. It's just, <sighs> just get the chills thinking about that movie. But y'all should see if you haven't seen it. I don't recommend watching it alone or in a theater or with surround sound. That's or why I haven't watched it. You know, I mean, I have plenty of opportunities being by myself overseas, and that is the main reason I haven't because I am by myself. <laughs> um, so no, nah, but thank you so much again. Just want to thank everybody. Thank the fans. Fifty episodes is pretty incredible feat for us. Um, from when we started. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, appreciate you always. And it's up from here. Let this be known. We have a lot of things planned, a lot of things on the docket. So just let it be known that, man, we're not stopping. We're going to keep going and we got a lot more for y'all. So like always, follow, like, share, comment, um, uh, retweet, subscribe. like, subscribe, subscribe. Um, to CNDMs, uh, CNDMs on, um, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and the CNDMs podcast or CNDMs podcast on YouTube. Still have no Snapchat working on that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, appreciate y'all. Thank you again. And we'll see you guys season four. See ya. Surprise, surprise. He did the match. He did the monster match. The monster match. It was a graveyard smash. He did the match. It caught on in a flash. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. From my love.